folks, and uh, thank you for joining us for the Administration and Operations Committee for September the 21st. Um, we, as far as attendance, uh, we are missing Councillor Coleman, Councillor Gatward, and Councillor McAlpine uh, at this point in time, but we do have quorum, so we are going to move forward. And if they show up, then uh, uh, the clerk will, will, will note what time they come in. Um, as far as the agenda, does anybody have any additions to the agenda this evening? Seeing none, there is an addendum. Can I get a mover to for the agenda as the addendum? Mayor Bailey, Councillor Ferrier, any questions? All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Declaration of pecuniary interest. If you have so, please do so at the time or now. Councillor Bell. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm going to declare a conflict of interest on item 8.4. 8.4, thank you very much. Any others? Seeing none, we'll move on uh, for delegations. We have a few delegations with us this evening. The first delegation is John Lowe for a request for refund for minor variance fees. Mr. Lowe, are you with us? John Lowe? Hello. Hi there. Good evening. Uh, welcome to our, our committee. You were one of the delegations this evening, so uh, we'll give you the floor. And just a reminder, you have 10 minutes for your presentation, and then there'll be a question period afterwards. Uh, sorry to interrupt you there just prior for you to get started. Uh, note that Councillor McAlpine has joined. So, Mr. Yeah. Lowe, go ahead, please. Yeah, I'd just like to start off by thanking you for letting me uh, speak. And um, I just want to start from the beginning. When I originally started building, my, I misinterpreted attached to detached from the house. So I originally had it up, I was gonna lean it up against the house. And when I got called on, the building inspector showed up. He told me I cannot do that without a permit. So I applied for a permit, which I was denied. I was told I didn't need a variance because my house was at its max. No one told me it was over the max already. So I was told to avoid uh, uh, a variance that I could build an exterior building under 108 square feet without needing a permit or a variance. So I, can, I started building that. I fr had it all framed up, had the bill inspector show up, took pictures, measurements, and he told my wife that everything's fine. Continue on. So I continued on. Then after I finished the whole thing, I've been told I needed a variance now. So I applied for a variance. I've been approved of it. And I just feel that I, uh, right from the beginning, I've been doing everything I was told to avoid it. And if I needed a variance from the beginning, I probably would have built it differently, but I didn't. So um, I also, the variance price went up $500 from last year. So I kind of feel like I should at least be reimbursed at least $500. Um, other than that, that's all I need to say other than what I submitted. Okay, uh, thank you for that. Anybody with any questions for Mr. Lowe? Councillor Miller. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, three to the speaker. Um, sorry, can you repeat what you said at the start? I, re I read your letter that you submitted, um, and my understanding was that it was a detached shed, but you're saying um, that it's, it's up against the house. Is that correct? Uh, no, when I originally was building before, like one of my neighbors called on me, I had it up against the house and the bill inspector said, I cannot do that without a permit. So after I went through all the steps and I was told in, in order to avoid a permit and a variance, just build a shed or a, like a, detach, or a, a detached building or whatever. So that's okay. what I was doing. Why, okay. Uh, okay. That clears that up. Um, and, and why, what do you need the variance for? It's, it's, I, it's not I guess, the size I guess, of the shed, is it? No, it's because I guess my house was originally built uh, over the building 40%, I guess. Of lot coverage. Of lot yes. coverage or exceeding? Is that what you said? Okay. It was lot coverage, yes. Okay, I got that. Okay, thank you. Councillor Howes. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Through you uh, to John. Just, I just wanted to clarify... Um, in, in your response to Councillor Miller and in your, 
your verbal description, you were saying that, so, so after the building inspector, somebody called the building inspector, the building inspector showed up, said, you can't do what you're doing with it being attached to the house. I understand that. And then you said, you talked to somebody from the county who told you that if you built the shed separately, you wouldn't need uh, a, an adjustment or, or a building permit. Can you just clarify who you spoke to and when? Um, I spoke to, I, I can't 100% say it was Amanda originally. Um, the first time she told me to build like an exterior building under 108 square feet to avoid a like variance. But I also mainly spoke to Brandon Kortlev, who um, he told me all this, all the measurements and stuff I had to follow and everything, all the guidelines I had to follow in order to avoid everything. Okay, th thank you. That just helped kind of clarify. And and was this uh, earlier this year or was this last year? This was last year. This was when I first started building in uh, probably, I want to say July, maybe of last year. Okay, thank you. And one last question. Uh, where do you live? Where is this? Yeah, this is in Paris. Okay, thanks. Yes. Any other questions for Mr. Lowe? Just, just a point of order. Don't we need his full address for at the beginning of his delegation? Mr. Lowe, if you could provide that, please. Sorry, what's that? Your, your full address? My full, oh, sorry, uh, 25B Griffiths Drive, Paris, Ontario. And 3L4B7. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, uh, thank you for that presentation, Mr. Lowe. Uh, what I'm going to do, committee, if it's okay with you, is we're going to uh, we're going to take each of these separately and, and understand how we're going to proceed with each of them. So, uh, for 4.1, uh, how does committee look to proceed? Councillor Ferrier, um, I'd move to um, um, approve the request for a refund of minor variance fees. Start with that. Seeking a seconder. Councillor Chambers, second. Any questions? Councillor Bell, and then Councillor Miller. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm, if, if, if this is only about building a 108 foot unit in the garden, I'm sympathetic, but is there an issue of lot coverage that we need a little bit more insight in, into? And I haven't heard anything from our staff yet, of course, so I would not be supportive of saying yes at the moment without having some insight from staff. Thank you for that, Councillor Bell. I see Matt's come on. Uh, Mr. Vaughn, if you could add anything to that. Yeah, through, through the chair, um, the delegation's correct. They, um, when the shed was built, it did contribute to um, adding to the lot coverage. And um, as the delegation did mention, their um, dwelling was built at a, percentage that was already over the lot coverage uh, minimum or maximum, I should say. So when the shed was built, it just made it a little bit more. The dwelling, the lot lost its uh, non-compliance for lot coverage and the variance was required. So um, this application went to committee of adjustment last week. It was conditionally approved and um, here we are tonight. Does that answer your question, Councillor Bell? Uh, yes, it does. Um, and I'm, I'm interested to know uh, if, if the $2,000 is the cost of that variant. Through the chair, the current cost is $2,000. Um, if this would have been applied for last year, the cost would have been $1,500. Okay. Uh, Councillor Miller. So, sorry, Councillor Bell, is that, is that good? Okay, Councillor Miller. You had something? You're Sorry, on mute. I, yeah, no, I, I'm aware. It's a mouse issue, not a mute issue. Um, just, I just want to say um, I'm not supportive of refund the whole amount. Anybody else doing this would have had to, to pay the full variance. He did go through the committee of adjustment. Um, I'm, I'm kind of surprised that that motion come up, but I would be supportive of refunding $500 because it sounds like he would have applied last year if he had known he was exceeding the full lot coverage at the time. So. I won't support the full 2000 but I'd certainly support uh, 15, uh, refund of 500. Any other comments, questions to the motion? Yes. 
Councillor Ferrier? Um, yeah, two things. One, I, I make the motion as such because you know, try try the one and see see what happens. I, I hate when we go with the middle and we don't know what would happen on either end. Um, but on the other piece, just there's, a, I hate to use a word, but there's a bit of a dispute or a miscommunication, or um, it seems like there's a miscommunication. Staff have talked about the process before that, but what about the process at the beginning? If staff could maybe comment on, you know, what did they advise that he wouldn't need one, and and maybe give a, a bit of a staff point of view on on that side of it. Matt, can you comment to that? Yeah, through the chair to Councillor Leferrier, um, staff would be happy with providing council with a short report uh, regarding the history of this file. Uh, this would be something that we could provide to council for our PDC meeting next month. With that said, then, would it make sense, Mr. Chair, through you to, to defer this until for one cycle? Well, that would be up to committee if that's the way committee... Uh goes i think it would make sense if we have more information coming in so uh motion to defer i believe overrides the the motion that was on the table um, so, no. so councillor ferrier and councillor house so any questions to the deferral uh jyoti i see you've come on here is there something you would like to add uh, through you, Mr. Chair, the only point I'd like to raise is if at the end of the day, council determines that a refund of any amount is warranted, that um, the applicant uh, work with the legal department to prepare a release. So that way um, there isn't any issues after the fact. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you for that. Any other questions to the deferral? We're talking one cycle here and staff will come back to us. Councillor Chambers, something? Yeah, I'm not sure I can speak to uh, uh, the tabling motion, Mr. Chairman, but uh, I would prefer to deal with the uh, issue tonight. I think that if uh, the uh, uh, if Mr. Lowe was told that he didn't need a, a variance and then he built it, and then when he's almost finished, he's told that he does, I think that's a little bit uh, misleading on our part. And I believe that the full refund would be necessary. Having said that, uh, if the motion is deferred, uh, uh, I would uh, uh, ask that it be deferred for one cycle and then brought back in its uh, uh, original format the motion I'm talking about. Yeah, and I think that's uh, I think that's what Mr. Mr. Vaughn said that one cycle and they could have a bit of a staff report to give us a little bit of history on this. So, any other questions to the motion on the table for a defer? All those in favor of deferral for one cycle? Opposed? Motion to defer is carried. So Mr. Lowe, what will happen is as staff said, they're going to write up a report on this. Uh, they are going to give it to council for our next cycle to review. And then this motion will be back on the table. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much for your time. You too. Okay, so moving on to 4.2, uh, Nathan and Jenny Das from uh, 58 Capron Street. Um, again, just a reminder, you have 10 minutes for your presentation and then there'll be a question period. So the floor is yours. So my name is Nathan Das and I'm the owner of 58 Capron Street, Paris, located at the corner of Capron and Jane. I bought the property from my wife's parents who bought the property from Linda Geary in 2012. My property, which dates to about the 1850s, is a never-ending project, and my wife and I love history, so we take on the challenge and continue to make improvements as time and funds allow. Uh, this past summer, I repaired the front entrance of the house, which had been not usable for some time. The wooden deck had rotted. Uh, next came the repair of the driveway on Capron Street which had also not been used in quite some time. We had planned to begin using the front entrance and wished to receive guests there. The Jane Street access, which is shared with 66 Jane Street, gives me access to the garage and is useful for bringing groceries directly into the kitchen, but it's not an ideal spot for bringing in guests. There's no way to get from 66 Jane to the front of the house unless you go back on the street and walk all the way around the corner. The house is on a hill, and so there really is no safe, especially in the winter, walk path to the front of the house. So the 
driveway on Capron Street was the driveway to be used to walk up to the front steps of the house. I talked to the adjacent neighbor, 60 Capron Street, and found the property stakes uh, to remain on my property and to avoid the trees on the hill. After entering through the county cut curb, a driver must immediately turn left to park their vehicle parallel to the curb on the county boulevard. This lines up with the moss covered area, which has the basic dimensions needed to park two vehicles, one in front of the other. As tree roots have lifted that section of driveway next to the trees, I added fill on the other side, the curb side, so that it would be level again. And the depth ranges from about an inch near the trees to about a foot near the curb. That's how significant the slope of the driveway had become. And it's because they're spruce trees and spruce trees have surface roots that when those roots were growing, it was continuously lifting the land on the side of the hill where the trees are growing. So the county received a complaint and I was ordered to remove the fill and return the county property back to its original condition within two weeks. And as I'm sure you can appreciate, it was distressing so my mom, Jenny Das, volunteered to help me work with county staff to resolve the situation. While some communication was verbal, much was via email, and the last email received from county staff indicated no further questions would be answered unless a lawyer was involved. Contact was made with counselor Mark Leferrier. He was very helpful in outlining steps I could take to have my case heard by you council members something that would not have been possible if I chose to do a legal issue. A final email was sent to county staff indicating we had consulted with our ward counselor and would be asking for a spot on the first available council meeting agenda. At that time, we also requested they, they retract the order or at least hold it in abeyance until after council meeting. I was disappointed that the county staff ignored our request and so not to incur any fines, I dutifully removed the fill. While I was removing the fill, my neighbors came to see me work and uh, they wanted to hear my story. So after telling them my story, they wanted to also be invited to this meeting and to lend their support. As I was not sure if this was possible, I asked my neighbors to, that had visibility of the driveway to sign a petition. My neighbors also commented about how difficult it is to find, find parking along Capron Street as it has only parking on one side of the road and is often full of parked cars. Allowing my guests to park on this driveway will help alleviate that problem. I could not bring the driveway back to its original condition as the moss was easily raked along with the fill. After removing the fill, I decided I would dig down a bit to see what was underneath all the moss. I discovered the original paving stones only a couple inches below the surface. And as seen in the picture, even the cable company gave up on digging. They just put the cable in, in the moss essentially. In my effort to understand more about the history of the property and the driveway, I discovered that while the property is very old, it has had very few unrelated owners. The listing printed on May 15th, 2012, was from Linda Geary, and she was the owner, indicating severance is possible, formerly two parcels of land. I have further found out that this is because the garage was a sawmill operated by her father, and that would explain why there's two driveways, one to that sawmill garage and one to 58 Capra on the house. We contacted Linda Geary, and she provided much more history about the property and the driveway in question and has provided a letter. Linda Geary's tenants used the driveway on Capron up until the property was sold to my in-laws. There are two other houses in my immediate area that have the same situation. The house on the other side of the road at the corner of also Capron and Jane has two access driveways, one off each street, just like my property, and the one off Capron Street is paved only on the boulevard. At the other corner, three houses up uh, on the same block as me, the property also has two access driveways on the corner and one of them on Jane Street 
as only possible parking on the boulevard. The access driveways on my property are in keeping with the historical nature of the property. For the front Capron driveway, I use stone and fill as opposed to pavement. And at no time were either of these locations, my Jane or my Capron street driveways uh, converted to lawn. Nature just took its course and made the front one on Capron look green with all the moss. So my request is that I'm allowed to add sufficient fill to my Capron Street driveway to make it level and safe so that I can park my or guest vehicles, or that if a permit is needed, that you would allow me to uh, to approve such a permit and allowed me to uh, to restore this driveway. Thank you for your time. I'm happy to answer any of your questions. Okay, thank you very much for that. Uh, questions for Mr. Das? I see Councillor Howes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you uh, to Mr. Das. Um, so uh, thanks for all the details in your, your thorough um, submission. Um, I'm sympathetic to your to your situation. Uh, I do remember when Linda Gary lived there. Uh, and I appreciate the fact that you've you've you have support of, of most of your neighbors, uh, perhaps not all of your neighbors, because it's in I mean somebody made a complaint, right? Um, I wondered if you could clarify a couple of things. Um, if you I'd like if you could for context for all of us, could you please clarify the way the ownership of the Jane Street driveway, how that works and like where where's the property line and like how do you uh, share that with the neighbor? I'm interested in about that. I'm also interested in 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 your your proposed concept for the new driveway on Capron. Uh, if you're if you're envisioning one vehicle parked on the boulevard or two vehicles parked on the boulevard and and Ultimately, we I think we're probably going to have to get some staff feedback on this because the the boulevard that you're proposing to park on parallel to the curb inside the curb, I'm guessing is actually county land like the, the county owns a certain number of feet inside from every curb. So um, there's going to be some some deals. But if you could clarify those two questions, please. So they. Uh, driveway on Jane Street is shared between 66 Jane and 58 Capron. It's um, the width of two cars divided right down the property line, but that driveway goes straight back to the garage. And uh, I don't know what other information you need there. That driveway was in pretty much an equal state when I owned the house as the front driveway where the original asphalt was uh, basically just chunked up rock and sand and dirt and grass. And I put it a screening, but just enough down to level it so I could park on it again. So I think one of the issues that I had with the city when I talked to them was that if both driveways were in a bad state, but both driveways belong to my house. I was never really told that I couldn't have both driveways and I might've chosen to choose to repair a different driveway. But the reason for me repairing the back driveway first is because I was also fixing the garage and coming in through the kitchen was efficient for us. But having guests really was the idea when you own a house is to have people come to the front of the house. And so the front driveway was on my to-do list so I could have people enter the front of my house. <clears throat> now, when it comes to the parking on the boulevard, I again, especially with Linda's letter, that was an official city approved parking spot. The city cut that curb out and that was an officially used parking spot by the owner of 58 Capron for as long as she can remember. And the letter indicates that she even had the curb cut out changed by you guys from one location to another because a neighbor was also using her driveway access. So I think because the driveway was never changed into anything else, it is a long-standing driveway that just needed repair. And that's what I intended to do with it. I'm not trying to change anything. And when you look at the 58 Capron Street entrance, 
the hills on all sides to that entrance, that is the only space that you could actually park on. That's why it's that shape and that's why it's the logical distance and size of a two lane a two car parked driveway because as soon as you hit the end of that two car distance you're on an immediate hill and with those trees on the other side you couldn't park anywhere else you would just come into that curb you would take that left and you would park there and it's a one car spot if you have a bigger car i'm sure like a van but if you've got a, just two small cars it would be a two car spot thank you for the clarification any other questions? Seeing none, how, uh, thank you for your presentation, Mr. Dawes. How would committee like to proceed? Councillor Wheat? Uh, yes, I'm a little bit familiar with the area um, and it's difficult to make improvements up there at Jane and Capron. Um, and it appears to me that the individual is trying to improve this parking situation, parking has always been a problem no matter where you are in the county of Brant. And it appears to me he's trying to improve things. And I would uh, move that his request to do what he wants to do be granted, seeking a seconder. Seconder for that, Councillor Ferrier. Any questions to the motion? Councillor Ferrier. Uh, not a question. I just wanted to clarify because I, I think there was a little bit of a game of broken telephone in, in Nathan's very good um, written piece, but I just wanted to clarify that when I spoke to his mother, I believe, uh, Ginny, who's on the on the line as well, um, what I had said around the piece was just the simple fact that if it became that there are things they could do before uh, taking legal action, which I'm glad they've done because that can be costly and a pain, but also that if it does become a legal piece between the corporation of the county of Brant and the homeowner, then as counselors, we can't speak to it to them. Uh, which is just very standard that if it's, you know, a court legal proceeding, we, we have to kind of take on the role as, you know, members of the county apparatic, uh, apparatchik. So, um, yeah, I just want to clarify that because it's not very clear in the, in the appendix, but um, I, I think it's just a, an honest misunderstanding. Okay. Councillor Bell. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, to you, I guess, uh, uh, maybe through you to staff, uh, we've heard the, the, story from the point of the applicant. What are the reasons that the county are giving for rejecting the application? Who from staff can speak to that? Jyoti, I see you come on here. Thank you, through you, Mr. Chair. So uh, just to uh, back up a little bit, my understanding, uh, sir, is that there has been no permit application made um, and that this is why there was a complaint and bylaw enforcement obviously um, acts upon complaints that have been received. Bylaw did not take any further action because um, Mr. Doss actually uh, fixed the, the area along the boulevard. And so when uh, the uh, bylaw enforcement officer went back a few weeks ago, because it was fixed, there was no further action to take. Um, the, the one piece that, uh, for staff anyway, which would be quite useful, is this notion of, when I heard Mr. Dow say that the parking on the boulevard was something that was approved previously, um, that the curb cut was approved, we don't have any records of that. And so if he's got some documentation uh, to provide us to, to substantiate that position, that would be very helpful to have. And uh, so far I've not seen that. Um, and uh, my understanding is that if there's going to be a portion of the boulevard, which uh, Councillor Howe's uh, reference was county property, I believe you're correct in that, sir, that um, there needs to be a permit process and uh, that has, hasn't happened. And uh, we may need to require an encroachment agreement or some type of thing. So that way those issues are covered off. But um, to me, I don't see this as being something that's insurmountable. It just needs to go through the uh, appropriate process. That's all. Those are my comments. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, you're good with that, Councillor Bell? Uh, uh, yes, I am. I think it, it, what uh, Jyoti has, has said there is, seems entirely logical that we should follow our own process rather than take a, a decision now in the absence of having followed that process. So I would not support the motion as proposed. Councillor Howes. Thanks, Mr. Chair. 
Yeah, I think like, again, I I'll echo that I'm I'm supportive of of the ultimate goal of of the of the de- we'll call him the delegation rather than the applicant because I don't think he's actually applying for anything. Um, the I I would like some clarification that if if this council is supportive of of this driveway happening. I'm still not completely clear on, is he actually asking to restore an existing driveway or does he have to apply to add a driveway? And I, and I understand the history and, I, and I'm, I'm sure he, he doesn't have the, 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 the town documents and I'll, I'll, I'll point out to the, uh, the delegation that we never call ourselves a city. Um, and, and if it was something that the town of Paris did 25 years ago when Linda Gary lived there or before that, when her dad lived there, that, you know, that doesn't necessarily dictate a precedent today, but I, I am, I am looking for some clear technical clarification um, on, on whether we would call this him restoring an existing driveway or, or whether he has to apply for this additional driveway with the support possibly of council. I see Mr. Walton has come online here. You got uh, something to add here, Rob, please. Hey, Mr. Chair to Councillor Howes. Um, I, I think the crux of the question here is what the proof is that there was an existing driveway there and then, and then where we would proceed to that. Regardless of that, um, any work that's done by a private owner within the boulevard needs a public works permit prior to that. that that's that's um, um, simple business. And um, I don't think that the way that that was constructed initially would ever have been approved by us anyways, just the way that, um, you know, the riprap was adjacent to the curb and da 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 is not something that we would promote. Um, so I, um, I think that there's a few things that, that would need to be straightened out in this going forward for there to be a successful application. Councillor House. A follow up then to that is thank you, uh, Rob. I, I do understand that. Um, so then I think the next part is is perhaps we we need to rework the motion a little bit to say that council supports the idea of the second driveway and encourages the homeowner to apply for a public works permit. Well, I think that's more than a than a friendly amendment to the motion here. So I'm going to I'm going to go to Councillor Leferrier here to speak to the motion that's on the table, and then we'll go back to the mover to understand how he wants to do it. Thank Council you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I have some information because because I've had a lot of emails from folks. This is from uh, Shannon Labelle, who's our one of our planning technicians. And she says here in an email to the applicant, um, the subject property located on 58 uh, does not appear to have once does appear does not appear to have once been two separate lots. It does appear to have had land conveyed from 60 uh, at some point through an approved severance. However, I was not able to find out when that was. So I, I think there's a piece here too with records on our end as well. But I mean, we do have a counselor, a former counselor in Anne, um, saying that it was used as such and. We have at least one counselor on on the table who's lived in that area who says he he remembers it being used as such as well if I'm understanding Steve correctly, so I, I don't know that we're going to get you know the documents that we maybe need at that point, but it, it seems like they're they may be there like there's some smoke here and I just want folks aware of that. Um, however, we end up voting and whatever process this takes, but you know again if that's on our end that we also don't have um, the documents available. Uh, that becomes a bit of a, a tougher one to go. But I mean, we have a counselor and a former counselor both saying that they've seen it in some way, shape or form, it seems, and, unless I'm wrong. Okay. Uh, Mr. Walton, do you want to add to that? Through you, Mr. Chair to Council, uh, perhaps a report on this would be um, uh, would be wise. Uh, you know, we, we got to watch out for setting precedent and other, you know, you, you're going to have a whole lineup of people coming for these things if uh, if you approve this without any of the other legal background stuff looked at. So, and I didn't want to get into the whole thing of planning for variances as if, if it wasn't uh, deemed historic and you needed to amend the zoning bylaw to allow you to have two entrances as well too. I'm not sure what the implications of that. Maybe Jody could uh, chime in on that. And, and uh, but so there's, there's a whole lot of issues here that I think that before you get in and we deal with entrance applications all the time, you know, very few of them make it to you. 
So I think it would be wise for council here to step half step back, ask for a staff report and us to one council cycle, bring that back to you if we can find the information. I would like Jyoti to comment on that. Please come on. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. And through you, uh, Mr. Walton's correct. There's There are issues of legal non-conforming that were alleged by the property owner. Um, and there was some information conveyed to the property owner that legal non-conforming deals with structures and buildings, not necessarily driveways. And this is why the records that they may have would be useful. Now our records, the county's records go back to 2000. So that's, you know, uh, uh, over 20 years. So um, typically materials aren't kept forever. And so if there are even older materials than that, we'll, we'll have to do some digging, but it would be beneficial. And I agree with Mr. Walton that I think it would be beneficial for council to have that information before it entertains any decision uh, with respect to this issue. Okay, I'm going to go just uh, stand by Councillor House. I'm going to go back to Councillor Weed as the original mover uh, with the conversation that's gone on now. Um, do you, would you uh, be willing to um, revamp your motion to, to come back in one cycle with more information or how do you want to play it? Well, it sounds like the staff wants to do something. So I'll, I'll be, I just withdraw my motion if my seconder is agreeable to withdrawing. I was just trying to make this simple. <laughs> uh, I, I'd, I'd prefer the deferral I, I, that I think Steve wants to make. Can we, can we okay, let that so, process so, hang on, Councilor Deferrier, I, I appreciate that, but let's let's just, just I just want to let Councilor Wheat just finish talking here, please. I'm sorry, I, I only spoke because I'm the seconder. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, I, and I appreciate that. Yeah, I just wanted to confirm that Mark is supporting me to withdraw it. I just, a, a little bit familiar, a friend of mine, Bob Purley, lives up there. I know in the past 17 years, there's always been little issues to try and make Jane Street a little bit more accessible. And I just thought this might be an opportunity to try and do something better for the community. I'm sorry I made the motion. No, don't don't be sorry at all, mm -hmm. Councillor Wheat. Um, uh, Councillor Howes, very quickly. Yeah, thanks. I, I and, and I, I I appreciate Councillor Wheat's uh, efforts at expediting this and and uh, I wish the world was as easy as that sometimes I wanted to make a clarification to a point Mark was making related to what I think was was my support of this and I do support it and I do believe it was used for parking back in the day I believe what Linda Gary's put in the letter I, I walked by this house um, every day on the way to high school for a number of years in the early 80s that was like 30 years ago um, I don't remember whether I, I can, whether I saw cars parked in there now or not, or then or not, but I, I do believe them when they say that that, that that was the way it was. I'm prepared to make a motion if you like, Mr. Chair. Okay, um, so just a very quick point of clarification, Mr. Howes, it was uh, 40 years ago you went to high school when you were, <laughs> anyway, I just thought it would add that. So uh, from what I'm hearing here, there's a little bit of information that, uh, that needs to be dug into here. I think it would be appropriate um, to get that information before we make any decisions. It appears the, the mover and the seconder are prepared to uh, withdraw the motion. And I'm gonna go to the seconder now, um, Councillor Ferrier. Why don't I agree to withdraw the motion, but with um, guidance to staff to come back with a report in one cycle. And, and I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, um, as the clerk, I think if we withdraw the motion, we can just put, um, uh, we can recommend staff, like a, a suggestion to staff to come back. Does that have to be a separate motion or we can just do a recommendation to the staff to, to bring this back? You can direct staff to prepare a report. Yeah. Yeah, I don't I'm think we need that. a motion for that. So so the, 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 the motion, the mover and the seconder have agreed to remove the motion. Uh, I think we're looking for direction for staff to bring a, a report back within a cycle. Uh, Councillor Chambers, I'm gonna go to you for a first speaker. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I think the, the crux of the matter is, is uh, General Manager Walton has suggested is not so much the uh, uh, the uh, approving the driveway, but it's the alterations uh, that accompany the, the uh, uh, driveway that are the issue as it relates to county lands. So the report should uh, 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 key, I believe, on, on what the alterations are proposed to be and then that gives uh, county staff a, uh, a, a mechanism to uh, judge the appropriateness of the, uh, the application. But uh, it's not so much the uh, entrance, it's the alterations to the uh, area uh, 
uh, abutting the, the entrance. Okay, thank you for that. Okay, so what we're hearing here is we're going to, uh, we're going to direct staff to come back with a report in one cycle uh, with information on, on this particular request and how it can go forward. Councillor Ferrier, last speaker. Yep. You, you need a motion to receive? Because if so, I'd make it. Um, I don't think we need the motion to receive if we're just uh, if we're just uh, directing staff to come back with a report. Okay, thank you. So uh, to uh, Mr. Das and uh, and Ms. Das there. So what's going to happen is this is going to be uh, one cycle. Staff is going to come back from a report uh, as was requested earlier. If you have any other documentation, please bring it forth to staff so that can be included in the uh, in the report and the decision making as we go forward with this. Okay. I, I don't think there's going to be much, as you guys indicated, as far as um, available information other than Linda Geary's testament, because she's the only one that was present in this home during the time period of questioning. So yeah. I think if you're looking for documentation, she's the only one that's really going to have any. Yeah. And as I say, if there's anything you have, that's great. And, and again, uh, staff will, will do their report and come back and then the information we have from there. Uh, we'll put forth on the decision. Okay. All right. So we are going to move on uh, to, oh, very quickly, Mrs. Doss. Yes, I just wanted to speak for, for a second about it as well, because the, the curb cutout was a city approved cutout. That's our evidence of what the city was, or sorry, the, sorry, county, uh, town um, approved and the in our correspondence and verbal uh, back and forth with folks from this from the county they gave the impression that there were a lot they would not have approved this driveway uh, they didn't believe it was a driveway they didn't they said they couldn't have two accesses they said Nathan couldn't park on the boulevard and so it was like every roadblock and then I was trying to get as much information out of the county I could to see when it did the county say you couldn't use this driveway and they cannot provide any evidence. They could not. They were, um, that's why I think in the end they were getting frustrated with me. I was trying to get evidence out of the county about, well, when was it taken away? Because we had evidence it had been used as a driveway from Linda and, and so on. Right. So okay. That, and that's that's all I wanted to add. No, I appreciate that, and I think that's that's uh, even adds to the understanding here that we need to we need to get all the facts written down into a report from both sides, and then we have all the all the information we need to go forward. Okay. So thank you for that. Uh, we are going to move on to four point three. Um, uh, Simon Gapsch. Simon, are you there? Simon, I think you're on mute, if it's Simon's iPhone. Hello. Hey there, um, thanks for joining. Um, if you could just uh, give your address to the clerk and then you have 10 minutes for your presentation and we'll go from there. Okay, thank you very much. Um, my address is 2 Old Mill Street in Paris, Ontario, N3L 3K1. Um, so I just wanted to go through, I have three, three things to kind of go through. I'm not sure if, uh, this is for council or not, but uh, I guess with our expansion here in Paris, obviously our population is growing significantly. We've been kind of digging into a uh, school system for our son and our, our daughter's five months old, our son's three and a half. And we realized that yeah. there's a lottery system for the French immersion program in Burford. And we don't really offer uh, public French immersion in Paris. Uh, we do offer a Catholic French immersion. Um, so I was just wondering if uh, council's looking at building new schools in the future uh, due to this population growth. And clearly there's a need uh, for more French immersion because if we're doing a lottery system, it seems like there is the need there. Um, my second point is also seeing all these new developments. I know coming from Hamilton, each developer had to designate a certain amount of green space uh, for parks, uh, just green area for people to play in. And I've noticed a few of these developments that I don't see in green space or parks 
And I'm just concerned that our increase in population is gonna make the parks in Paris like uh, be overrun with kids. And especially with COVID, it seems like that could be quite an issue. <clears throat> and then my third uh, part is with the water treatment plant right near our house. I talked to a neighbor and he was saying that uh, you guys are looking to expand it. Um, I haven't had any communication on it, so I'm not quite sure where to look or if, or if council could provide our neighborhood with communication on it. But I do know, like, I watch these tanker trucks go by every day, uh, do the loop of Hillside, Race, and Old Mill, and our roads are just getting battered. And if we are going to do any upgrades to the road system, I suggest that we uh, try to upgrade it and reinforce it with concrete so that we're not uh, dealing with the road getting destroyed every year by these tanker trucks just rolling around our, our uh, full circle there. So that's that's kind of the three issues. I'm sure you guys talked about this, um, but again, uh, I don't know. I don't know if I'm not looking in the right place to find this information. Uh, I hope you guys can kind of clarify. Obviously, the people ahead of me are doing building stuff, so I'm not sure if this is the right place or not. Um, but thank you for your time. And this is what I have. Any questions would be great. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you for joining us this evening. I can I can touch on a couple of these things. First of all, as far as schools are concerned, um, the county doesn't dictate um, the, the need for more schools or where the schools go. Uh, we are in, in communication with the school board and they're, they are aware of um, the building and development that is going on within within Paris and the county. Um, at the unfortunately, at the end of the day, it's it's the the school boards that will dictate uh, when and where the, the new schools are, will be required. Um, again, as I say, we, we're, in, you know, we're in discussions with them and they're aware of all the developments coming in. Uh, you're not the first person to, to say that we, we need another school. Uh, if you look up in the cobblestone area, there's the, the, the private, the uh, Catholic school and the public school there. there with the addition of all the development up there, there's been several people uh, that have come to me and say, we need another school. And uh, the response I give to them is the same in the sense that it is actually the, the school boards that dictate that, but we are absolutely in conjunction with them and they are aware of the building that is going on within the county. Um, as far as the green space with the developments, um, you, you're correct. There is a, a certain percentage of, of green space that's required with each of the developments. Um, now, one thing I, I will say is, is at the top of the Mile Hill, you're familiar with that. Um, there is a park, as you'll see there, they've leveled off there. There was a hill there and the Edgar subdivision, the Mile Hill subdivision, uh, where the park is going to be there. The hill is now leveled off and you're going to see some, uh, some work being done on the park up there. Uh, the parks are not always completed uh, within the first phase of That's a development. Uh, we try and get yeah. them done as quickly as we can, but it doesn't always happen in the first phase. But you're absolutely correct. And within each development, there is a certain amount of space that is required for green space and, and park space. Um, as far as the, uh, the water treatment plant, um, yeah, I'm, I'm right on Hillside myself and I see them, all the trucks going around Hillside. Uh, there is a, a master plan, a wastewater master plan that is, that is going to be, it hasn't been started yet, but it is something that we're looking into because uh, my understanding, uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, staff that's online, um, I think we have approximately eight years or so of capacity at that plant and we're going to have to do something with it. Uh, the discussions are happening, but it's not something obviously that can be can be completed overnight, uh, but there are plans to expand that. You're absolutely correct. I, I do see Mr. Walton has come in here. So I'm gonna ask him as far as the wastewater plant, if you can add anything to that. Hey, Mr. Chair, to the um, committee and the delegation. Um, um, the county is working on hiring the consultant to do the class EA um, um, study for the um, options for dealing with um, increased wastewater in Paris. Um, that um, report should come to council this fall. So the process to start that study will start. Um, that study will take 1.5 plus years to complete and then there will be a design process. So you won't see any actual construction there for probably upwards of about three years, but um, and, and a completion probably in your in your time frame of you know six to eight years um, is likely what um, what we would be um, um, going towards. But that class EA the delegation does, um, require public consultation and there will be notification on the website and to the to the local um, 
um, people as to um, um, when those meetings would be and how you can participate and get information about what's proposed. Thank you for that, Rob. Um, any committee have questions for the delegation? Uh, Councilor Miller. It just uh, not a question. I, I think I think the deleg the speaker did not um, approach the school board yet, if I'm correct. So what I would suggest, um, someone along your lines, Mr. Chair, is, is that uh, you gather with some like-minded parents and uh, yeah, be a delegation to the school board uh, meeting because they need they need to hear directly from from people like you. So that's what I would encourage. So okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Councilor House. You're on mute, Councilor House. If I think too loud. Thank you. Um, through you, Mr. Chair, real quick. Uh, just to, to, to Simon's point about uh, parks in the south end of town, um, if he lives on or around Old Mill Street, not far from Councilor Pierce himself, um, there is a dramatic absence of parks in that part of town. Agreed. And and has has been since those houses were built, um, and 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 no real municipal land to, to build parks on, and it, and it it is unfortunate, and it's a, um, it, it is a, an issue. I know that the general manager for for that uh, part of our county operations is listening, um, and and I, I don't know what the solution is. Uh, that the only thing I can say to reassure the the delegation is is when new growth is happening now appropriate land is designated for parkland as, as Councillor Pierce was saying. But um, unfortunately we can't turn the clock back to 50 years ago when the, <laughs> when the, when the houses were built um, in your area, if you live near Old Mill Street um, to, to apply the same program then. Thanks. Okay. Any other questions for the delegation? Uh, Mr. Gaps, does that uh, answer a few of your questions? Um, yeah, that's that's great. I like the idea of actually teaming up to get parents on board to go after the, well, not go after the school board, but to get the school board on notice to try to get us some more schools. Um, yeah, I think I think uh, the park situation, it is it is our area that we're kind of lacking. And I know when we first moved here, we got plans for that little space green section right near the wastewater treatment plant but i'm assuming that got voted down by neighbors or or whatnot and i'm assuming it's probably the same thing at bean park those abutting houses there probably vote that down as well to have any sort of climbers or anything there um it's it's too bad because bean park would be an ideal spot we go there all the time and there's tons of land there um but it's also a flood zone so we always obviously got to be careful. Um, but I guess the the one thing for, so it, it, it's good that I'm glad we're doing uh, the, the initial plans for the waste uh, treatment, but I, I was just trying to reinforce the idea of maybe we, sh like I know the pipes I'm sure are going to need to get upgraded in our area. I, I feel like it should be a valid issue to also upgrade the roads uh, like reinforce the roads if we are going to do that. So I'm not sure if that's council's um, proposal or, but that's that's my idea to, to kind of help this roadway. Right. No, and then we appreciate that input for sure. And that'll all yep. be, that'll all be part of that EA. And uh, like our general manager said there, when the EA starts, there's, there'll be several public meetings that'll be, um, that go hand in hand with that. As soon as it hits about seven o'clock at night, or ban the because um, everybody's on. Hello, Arnie. I'm not sure who Arnie is, but please put yourself on mute. Sorry about that, Simon. Okay. So if there's no other questions for that, I, I think um, uh, Mr. Gabs, you got some direction there. And uh, absolutely, if you have any other questions, uh, you know where I'm at. Uh, just let me know, and, and I can help you out with that. Sounds good. Thank you. Okay. Okay, um, so as far as that one committee, uh, can I just get a motion to receive on that one? Councillor Bell, Councillor Coleman, any questions? All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Uh, moving on to 4.4, uh, Bob Matisse, uh, response to staff report RPT 21-239. 
for request for refund of development charges. Uh, Mr. Matisse, are you on? I am. Okay, um, so if you could just state your name for the clerk and then you have 10 minutes for your presentation and then there'll be questions. It's uh, Bob Matisse. And Carol Richards. And Carol Richards. Co-owner of the, of the lot. Your address, please. 117 Highway 2, Princeton. Thank you, go ahead. The address of the property in question is number 1953 Highway Burford. So um, we did do a presentation or Bob did a presentation um, previously and it was being looked into um, regarding a redevelopment fee. Um, and so we purchased this lot and at the time there was no mention by that owner. He was totally unaware that there was apparently this arbitrary five year redevelopment timeframe in which a new home had to be built. So we saw a development fee as being something that basically was going to be a new not lot, not a lot in which there had previously been a derelict, dangerous, rat infested building. So in his good conscience for the community, he demolished that building in question. The lot has then sat past this arbitrary five year period. And I guess I question, first of all, where this fee comes from, how this fee is calculated, why it even would um, pertain to our particular situation. Um, at this point, um, we are starting to build. We did get our building permit and the only way to go ahead and get that permit was to pay this fee. And I just see this bylaw as making absolutely no sense because all it does is encourage derelict dangerous buildings to remain up in place so that people can potentially trespass, get injured, get squatters living in there, especially being out in the country. And to me, it made absolutely no sense when you are tearing down something dangerous and you're going to build something new um, in its place, why there would be any type of a penalty, if you will, um, for doing that. So I see, I have lived in Brant County myself here in Princeton for almost 30 years and paid my taxes dutifully. And I take a lot of pride in being in Brant County. I think it's a beautiful place to live. And I would hate to see a bylaw like this encourage people to leave basically eyesores, blight on our landscape in order to prevent themselves having to pay um, this type of a fee. Also, um, we were delayed in our building situation due to COVID. And I don't know if any um, allowances are given towards that because quite honestly, we couldn't even get a contractor. Nobody wanted to do any work. Um, the cost of lumber, as I'm sure you're well aware, was completely through the roof. So we had a lot of issues that we had to deal with and we will be improving um, certainly the situation that was on that lot uh, previously. Um, I can understand a redevelopment fee if you're improving and providing infrastructure to uh, a lot. Uh, in this case, we are out in the country, so we are not going to get sewer provided by um, Brant County. We are not going to get town water brought to us. We still have to put in a septic system that's probably going to cost us over $25,000, um, as well as drilling a well, um, all of those things too. So I just question this. I think this is um, a very, very detrimental bylaw on Brant County in general. Um, and all it's going to do for those of us that have lived here for as long as, as I have is decrease our land values because who wants to live next door to something that is basically an eyesore and dangerous. So I just question that. Um, I think under the circumstances that we should be in reimburse that amount of money that we had to pay. We were basically had to pay it in order to get moving so we could build our home that we've been waiting to build for over two and a half years now um, due to COVID. And uh, we've just basically decided, okay, we better pay it. 
because without doing that, we're never going to be able to get started. And um, either a full reimbursement or even a tax credit would be okay going forward. We will be paying taxes, of course, to Brant County for the next, you know, yeah. maybe we'll live for 30 years, <laughs> 40 years, I don't know. But um, yeah, something um, along those lines, because I do think that this is an exception. This is, was not a new lot. It was certainly not anything that Brant County had to put any money into. Um, we are, are doing all of that, improving the situation. And, um, and I think it's a bylaw that you should get rid of because it is only going to hurt you and all of us in the long run. Anything you want to add to that, Bob? No, that's, that's good. Um, thank you for that. Any questions for the delegation? Uh, seeing no questions, how would committee like to deal with this? Councillor Miller. Well, I'd like to move that to um, the staff report coming up later in the agenda. Okay. Councillor Chambers, you willing to second that? Um, Mr. Chairman, I'd sooner move the staff report here rather than Thank this you. for the staff report while the delegation is it's still here. Is online, if that's a, a, appropriate. And if that's uh, the, the wishes of council, then I, I'd like to speak to the, uh, the issue. Okay, so I'm going to go back to Councillor Miller. Are you willing to reverse that, Councillor Miller? Well, we'll, we'll, still move it to, we'll still move it to the staff report, but if you're going to, <laughs> I think what Councillor Chambers is saying is we're going to move the staff report forward, but we still going to tie it to that staff report. So, yeah. So I, I think, think that's fine. Yeah, I think that uh, that's probably the best idea while the delegation is here. Uh, so we have a mover and a seconder that we're going to attach that to the uh, to the report later on, and we're going to speak to it now. Can I get uh, all those in favor of doing that? Opposed? Carried. Okay, so we are going to move forward to staff report RPT 21-239, which is 8.1. And Councillor Chambers, you wanted to speak to the report. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. I, I don't know whether the uh, the author of the report wishes to uh, do a synopsis before we speak to it or not, uh, and, and I'll pause if, if that's the case. Otherwise, I, I would uh, like to move forward. Okay. I think uh, Mr. Rosebrills, come on, if you'd like to proceed. Uh, thank you. Through you, Mr. Chair. I, I don't have a presentation, um, but I am definitely open to any questions. Okay, so we do not have a presentation. Uh, Councilor Chambers, do you have a question? I don't have a question, uh, Mr. Chairman, but I, I would like to speak to the issue at hand if, uh, if there are no questions, but I'll, again, I'll pause if there are questions to the report. Any questions to the report? Councilor Bell, then Councilor Miller. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you to Adam. Um, in the report, you talk about the building being demolished without the benefit of a demolition permit. What was there ever subsequently a demolition permit brought forward? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, not that we have record of, so I would say no, there was never a demolition permit. Okay, Councillor Miller. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, several questions, I'll, I'll uh, Councillor Bell, give me a good segue to my first question, that's the demolition permit. What I don't understand, maybe it's not a question, maybe it's a comment. What I don't understand is why there was no demolition permit. Um, well, obviously the um, the owner at the time didn't apply for one. But here's the thing: I the, the house was used as uh, for fire training uh, when they burned it down. So I'm not sure what if there's any connection between uh, the fire department and the uh, building, but there should be at some point. I thought uh, they were work fairly close together, but I'll leave that for another day. Um, I got a couple of questions for you, Mr. Chair, to, to, to Adam. And uh, the first one, I, I'm, I'm kind of reading between the lines, but I believe what you're saying in the report is, is that this is a fairly common practice across Ontario, waiting five years. Is that correct? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, to Councillor Miller, that, that is correct. We did reach out to Watson and Associates, and, and that is what they... Uh, said it, it's very common 
right across Ontario, the five-year timeline. Okay, so that um, there, there's a bit of a refund or on the on the um, on the DCs. Is that is the refund the same if it was done uh, three days? If if we put up a new house three days after the old one was taken down, or if they waited four years, eleven months, and twenty nine days, is is it the same, or is it is, is it a scaled uh, refund for the DCs? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, it I would say any any time within that five year period from the time it's demolished to the time their uh, building permits issued, it is it's the same. It's not prorated or anything. Okay. Uh, yeah, that was the question. And then, and then the last question, in, in discussion with Watson Associates, did, was there any concern raised during those discussions about um, <laughs> the implications of such a policy, such as uh, people wanting to just leave up derelict buildings and, <laughs> so they wouldn't have to pay DCs? Did that come about in your discussions with them? I, so I, sorry, through you, Mr. Chair, I personally did not have that discussion. That was the chief building official, but I would say that it, it didn't come up. Rick Rick did not mention it to me. Um, okay. Yeah. No, no, that's fine. I just I wonder if it came up because uh, uh, for for committees. I mean that's I mean that's something that just pops into your brain as soon as you hear you, you hear about something like this. So okay, um, I appreciate the answers, Adam, and I'll wait for the discussion. Okay. Any other questions to the report? Councilor Chambers. Uh, seeing that there are no further questions, Mr. Chairman, uh, I, I will speak to the uh, uh, the issue, uh, the request uh, in, in in terms of the report, if, if that's uh, uh, okay. Yep, please do. And to do that, uh, I'm not going to uh, challenge the validity of the bylaw at this uh, point because it's uh, uh, it's a, an issue for discussion for another day and. And the, or the uh, delegation does make a good point uh, that this uh, a practice of uh, allowing demolished buildings to uh, uh, lapse uh, and later development charges is a good item of discussion. I think Councilor Miller was alluding to that. But in this case, uh, it, it's an arbitrary number of five years. Uh, and the issue is whether uh, another year or a year and a half the delay between the demolition time and the building time is uh, uh, crucial uh, for the collection and development charges. And in my mind, it isn't. Uh, if, if things would have went in a timelier manner within five years, we wouldn't be having this discussion. So uh, to, uh, again, common sense can prevail here. If it was five years in one day, Technically, according to our bylaw, it would fall outside the, uh, uh, the window of opportunity, if I might. So five years plus two days, five years plus two months, five years plus two years. I think two years is, is not unreasonable in the circumstances that have been described by the delegation. If it was 20 years, uh, that may indeed be a, a valid time lapse to collect development charges, but uh, an additional time frame added to the five years, in my mind, common sense would say that uh, it's a, uh, an un, unwarranted uh, uh, cost for the uh, property owners to uh, endure. Thank so you. Uh, Thank you. I, I will, uh, I, I'd be at the appropriate time, I would make the motion that uh, the development charges be reimbursed in the appropriate way, which I think is suggested that it has to be a grant back because you can't uh, you know, fiddle with the bylaw and, and uh, it has to be done right. But the bottom line is that the fee should be, re be reimbursed. Uh, and I would, uh, reimbursement might not be the right word, but I would be prepared at, uh, at this time, if you want, Mr. Chairman, to make that motion. You need a well, second here, Mr. John, you muted. Yeah, John. So I'm telling you, you're muted when I'm muted. How's that work? <laughs> <laughs> so, 
Councillor Chambers, okay, so I appreciate that. And, and Councillor Bell, you're willing to second that? Uh, I, I am, but I, I would like to make a comment to it as well, if I may. Uh, please do to the motion, yeah? Yeah. Uh, so just, just to follow up, I think that the logic that Councillor Chambers uh, laid out is very appropriate. Uh, the question is how much time beyond five years is appropriate? And if I read the report correctly, then it's anywhere between eight and 11 years between demolition and the awarding of a building permit. So it uh, kind of goes outside the two, two days, two months, two years window that Councillor Chambers mentioned. If it's as much as potentially six years, I, I have a struggle with that, even though I'm supporting the, uh, putting the motion on the table. And uh, perhaps staff could, could give us some insight on that. Adam, are you able to speak to that as to the time frame? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, I, I do see that Heather Mifflin, treasurer, is also online. Um, she may have more information regarding the development charge bylaw itself. Heather, welcome. Welcome. Um, through you, Mr. Chair, just to clarify the question where, um, that was asked, we're wondering where the five years comes from? No, I, I'll, I'll let Councillor Bell respond to that. You correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe what we're looking for here is I think it's more than uh, even a couple years after the five years that uh, uh, the permit has been done here. I think that was what he was going for, but uh, Councillor Bell? Yeah, I mean, if I read it correctly, it's anywhere between eight and 11 years between demolition and the delivery of a building permit, which, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm supportive of, of Councillor, uh, Councillor Chambers' latitude on this, but three to six years is beyond the limit in my mind. And I, I wonder what, what, what we open ourselves up to as a precedent in the county. How many times will people come back and ask us similar questions that, that we may have already just left in the past. Care to tackle that, Heather? Um, no? I, yeah, I think maybe Adam would be more prepared as to the timeline. Yes, uh, five years is what's in our bylaw. Um, and that's what Watson said is the normal standard across the province. There are some with less and there are a few with more, but five years is the standard. Um, if you, Councillor Bell is correct that it, if you're go, how far do you go outside of our bylaw? Yeah, I think that's the, that's the key here. Uh, Jyoti, I see you've come on. Do you wish to add? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Through you, I just wanted to indicate that when this council passed its development charges bylaw, it would have gone through an analysis process to determine what time frame was appropriate for this county. So it determined five years was the appropriate number. That's what was recommended by your consultant. That is standard across the province. This is a number that while I was on the OMB, I saw all the time. So I can tell you that when Mr. Roseborough gives you that answer, he's absolutely correct. The other aspect of the uh, policy requirement for having a five-year time frame is also not just about derelict buildings that remain, but also to incentivize individuals to get the credit and get something built after the demolition is done quickly. So vacant parcels aren't just sitting around. So there is a converse to that policy requirement. And I just ask you to, to keep that in mind. Um, the other thing I just wanna point out is that the province uh, did implement a suspension of limitation periods during the time of COVID Thank and you. that, uh, I don't think it's going to be what uh, the applicant is looking for, but that provided 183 days of hiatus, and that's come and gone. There was 183 days when the pandemic first started in March until September 14th, 2020. That's when it stopped, where the clock stopped, so people had some time. So that's that would have given some relief to those individuals who were affected by COVID as far as time frames were concerned. I know that this particular individual identified that as part of their rationale, but the province has already provided that and that has come and gone. So I just ask you to keep all of those things in mind. Uh, those are all my comments. Okay, thank you for that. So we've, we've got a motion on the table that's seconded. We're having some conversation about it. Uh, any questions to that motion, Councillor Howes? Mr. Chair, it's more of a comment than a question. 
Is that all right? Go ahead. I, I just, I'm, I'm concerned about the, like, I, I empathize with, with the delegation and it sounds like um, there's some information that they wish they had, uh, in, you know, at some point in the past, the, the, but I, I, it seems to me that we clearly established a rule book for this type of process. And I think if we start bending the rule book on, on a, a topic that's so critical to the municipality as development charges, I fear that we're going to enter into some, you know, establishing some precedents that, that are not going to be comfortable for us. Um, so I, I, I I, I'm struggling to support this motion in its current form. Any other, Councillor Miller, to the motion. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> we talk about anything else, Mr. Chair. Um, speaking to the motion, um, yeah, I, I appreciate staff saying this. Actually, they, they did pretty good. They, they poked holes in a lot of my arguments and they answered a lot of my questions. But we all understand that growth pays for growth, and, and we do that via development charges. Um, Here's the issue that I have with this whole development charges for an existing lot where a house existed not that long ago is that there is simply no new services are being used by this house that haven't already been created, that we haven't already built, whether it's a new fire hall, arena, library, a police station. Uh, we're not building new roads. We're not, we're not even putting in sewer waters or sidewalks or anything like that. This house <laughs> is based, is not using any any new thing. So, and, and, and like I say, growth pays for growth. Got that. But there's nothing to be paid for by this house. The seventeen thousand uh, dollars. This this house will benefit nothing, nothing from that amount. So, um, I'm I'm supportive of the motion, and uh, yeah, we'll see how it goes. So, thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Any other comments, questions to the motion? Okay. Seeing none, we do have a motion on the table to support the. Uh, um, return of the development trees in, in some sort, uh, whether it be, uh, we'll leave that to staff if the, if the motion goes forward, it is seconded. So I will call the question, all in favor of the motion? Opposed? Okay, I think we have a, can we do that again? I thought I saw four. I thought I saw five and five. Uh, Heather or Nancy, did you get the approved? Yes, it was a tie vote that I saw. Okay. Um, okay. So at the with the five five vote, the motion is defeated. Is there another motion on the table, or how are we going to go forward with this committee? Councillor Chambers. Mr. Chairman, could I ask that that be uh, the, the vote be recalled? I want to see who uh, uh, supported and who didn't. I didn't catch that. So could I ask the uh, uh, that the vote be recalled, which I believe is procedurally in our procedural bylaw? Yeah. Okay. So all those in favor of the motion, please put your hand up and keep it up. I'm seeing six votes. Okay. Yes. Something changed. Yeah, something did change. All those okay. against. Okay. So we just went from five five to six four. Councillor Wheat. Put your mind at ease. I was the one who changed. Thank you. I'm gonna give you a kiss. I was. I was tossing a coin around here on which way to go. And when I rethought, it changed. Now, if you rethink, call a vote again, it might go back to a 5 5 tie because I'm really in between on this one. Okay. So, so that's why I changed from 5 5 to 6 5, Johnny. Okay. So uh, I'm going to go to Councillor House and then that's it. You're just curious, Mr. Chair. I, and it's, it's all well and good that the uh, delegation wants to give Councillor Weed a kiss. But um, as she said, but uh, I'm curious, just curious on the process on this. You know, we, we, we had a meeting not that long ago where we vote, ended up voting twice because of, of um, whatever reasons. And, and, and do, we, do we just keep voting 
over and over. Uh, Heather, you've come in here. Heather, do you want to add something here? Um, if folks aren't speaking, please put your phones on mute. Go ahead, Heather. Okay, so originally council chambers, one sec. A couple of council members have their uh, need to mute as well. So just, sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay, sorry. So when we did it last time, um, the reason we re-voted is because in the middle there, we had a motion to uh, renew the vote. Um, this one here, I thought we were just doing a motion, second motion to clarify who had voted which way. Um, we certainly can do a motion to renew the vote and that just needs a, a majority of the committee to agree to a motion to renew because it's not, once again, it's been turned down by less than a majority of council. Um, but it's just, it's a technicality again because I thought we were just voting to clarify the five and five and who had voted how. But if someone's gonna change a vote to make it go in a different direction, then we really should have a motion to renew, to bring it back on the table, to, to actually do a different vote again. Okay, and thank you for that because that's that's a, what I thought we were doing too, is to understand who voted, which, who voted for each there. So do we have a motion to renew the vote? Councillor Chambers and Councillor Miller. Okay, so we've got a motion that, to renew the vote. All those in favor of, re now for clarification here, Heather, if we're renewing the vote, so in essence, we've, we've bypassed that 6-4, we're going back to renewing the 5-5 vote. Is that where we are? Right, so the 5-5 defeated motion is the one that was in order. Um, and that was the one that got defeated. So that's in order. And if we move to renew the vote, then we're gonna be re-voting um, on that same motion again. Okay, so we're, we're voting to renew the, the vote of 5-5, five, five, the motion that was in order there. So all those in favor of renewing, uh, Councillor Wheat, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I recall a tie vote at committee a little while back and then it went to council because it was defeated on a tie vote. So if I maintain my first vote to defeat, this would go to council because not all members of committee were here this evening. Am I correct, Heather? No, that was planning act applications require a specific resolution of council. So any decision there, defeated, tied, um, or approved has to end up at the council table. Committee, if this gets defeated at committee, Someone at council can bring it up again for discussion, but it doesn't automatically go there. Okay. Thank you. So we're voting on the renewal of the vote that was 5-5. Five, five. All those in favor of renewing that vote, please keep your hand up. Uh, Chair, I'm, I'm lost on this now. You've really confused me. Sorry, okay, so Council Bell, so what we're doing here for everybody, there was a vote of 5-5, five, five, which in essence defeated the motion. There was a recall of the vote, which was supposed to understand by Councilor Chambers who voted which way in that 5-5 five, five vote. The second time through on the vote, Councilor Wheat changed his vote to support it, which became 6-4. Then there was a question on how that happened, why that happened, the understanding that I was under, as well as I believe Councilor Howes and the clerk, that that renew, or pardon me, that recall of the vote was to understand which five voted for and which five voted against. So now we're doing a re we're doing a motion to renew that vote. So in essence, it would be a revote of that of the one that was five five. The one that was six four is off the table at this point in time. So we're going to renew the vote in essence to disregard what's been done and revote. 
I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, again, I'm, I'm, I apologise for perhaps not understanding this. My, my, my simple understanding is we voted 5-5. Five, five. If I understand from Heather, there's no way that we can change that right now. It can, Heather, I'll let you speak to that, but my understanding is we can, we can, there could be a call for a motion to renew that vote. Yep, the motion to renew the vote is the process to have another vote on it at the same meeting. So we, so we would be voting over, we'd be starting over from the beginning, right? Essentially. Correct. Okay. And yeah. do we need, do we need a super majority of council for that or is it a simple majority? Simple majority. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Bailey, you had your hand up. Well, I, I don't understand this at all. We had a vote, it was defeated. Why are, why are we messing with that vote? I understood the council chambers wanted to see who voted which way and asked to see the hands again. The hands shouldn't have changed. We didn't ask for a revote. This is this is completely hokey and not right. We voted. It was a tie. It was defeated. And now Councillor Chambers, through language of his own, has gotten this thing passed. Something is wrong with this system. Councillor Chambers. Uh, Mr. Chairman, it may be hokey pokey, and I resent that uh, characterization. Let me read. Article 34 of the procedural bylaw. Any member may at the same or any subsequent meeting move for a renewal of a motion that has been defeated by less than the majority of all members of council then in office. I am moving such a motion right now as a renewal motion. And if this passes, then we can vote on the other motion. Section 34 of the procedural bylaw is not pokey pokey in my mind. Mayor Bailey. The system that we just went through was hokey. Anyone watching this meeting right now wonders why we vote, something's defeated, and because of language that you've pulled out of somewhere, we can do it again until you get your own way. Council okay, Chambers, so, so I didn't- Hold on, Mr. Mayor Bailey, I'm gonna cut you off right there. So I'm gonna correct one thing. He, he is bringing it from the bylaw. So the bylaw itself, is correct. I, I agree the fact that um, it did not, what was asked for was a recall of the vote and it should have been who voted, which voted five for this and five for that. I agree the fact that things went array there because the vote was changed to six to four. The original vote was five, five. It is now being recalled or renewed, which is part of the bylaw that Councillor Chambers wrote, uh, spoke to there. So it is proper procedure, if that is the way it's gonna be done through that bylaw, it is able to be done. You're right, it's strange how we got to this place, but right now, as per the bylaw that we have, it is able to be done. So there is a motion on the table for renewal. That motion has been seconded. So we need to vote on the renewal of this vote in essence. So, all those in favor of the renewal of the vote. I'm seeing five. All those opposed to the renewal of the vote. I'm seeing five. So the motion to renew the vote has been defeated by a tie vote, which would suggest the original motion stands at a five, five count, which is defeated. Am I correct in that, Heather? Yes. Okay, so the, as it stands right now, the motion is defeated. Um, as was stated earlier, um, when, this, when this is brought up in council, there could be a, a motion to renew at that point in time. I believe it has to be two thirds. Vote in favor of renewing that at the point in time at council. So uh, <clears throat> apologies to uh, Mr. Matisse there. That, Councillor Coleman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This may maybe solve the problem somewhere down the road here is that we call for a recorded vote on every vote like this. And that way, everybody knows who the hell voted every which way, yay or nay. I, I'm tired of this because this is, as, like I say, it's been brought up again, 
We've done this here about two or three months ago. Now we're doing it all over again. You cannot get proper votes doing it on Zoom. There's no, you're trying to watch the screen and it doesn't always work. I think we need to recall if we record a vote and all these things like this, especially when uh, dealing with, with, with the public to, to uh, make it right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, thank you for that. Um, Councilor Chambers, last thing and then we're moving on. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, clarify what you just uh, said previously, uh, Mr. Chairman, which I believe is incorrect. And this is a recommendation from a committee that will be presented to council the recommendation from a committee doesn't need a super uh, majority. It can be defeated by a simple majority and then uh, uh, subsequently placed. So it, it's, it's just at this point, a recommendation from a committee to council. When it comes to council, we may be able to reject this recommendation and place another recommendation on the table. Heather? Yeah, so there will be no recommendation from this committee because um, it was a defeated motion, but council is absolutely able to make any kind of recommendation at the council table and move second and vote it by a normal majority. Okay, <clears throat> so I think, we're, I think we're as clear as we're gonna get on this. As of this point, it is defeated. When it goes to council, it, it could come back. So we are going to move on now. Um, that concludes our delegations for this evening. Uh, so Mr. Matisse, um, again, this will go to council and it'll be, uh, it'll be discussed at that point in time. So moving on to number five, adoption of the previous minutes. Can I get a mover please? Councillor Miller, Councillor Coleman, any question on the previous minutes? Seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. Uh, any business arising from the minutes? Seeing none, we will move on. Um, <clears throat> consent items. We have uh, consent items to be approved. We're going to start with 7.1.1, uh, which is RPT-21-232. Um, is there staff here that wishes to speak to this? Um, put it on the table, Councillor Wheat and Councillor Coleman second. Is there any staff here that wishes to speak to this? Mr. Walton? To, to you, Chair, to, to committee, I'm just here to answer any questions. I think it's fairly straightforward. Okay, any um, questions? Sorry, go ahead. We um, awarded this to the consultant with the highest score, and I don't know what's in the report here, but the lowest price as well. Any questions to the report for Mr. Walton? Okay, seeing none, I have a mover and a seconder. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion is carried. We will move on to 7.2, or sorry, 7.1.2, uh, which is RPT 21-238, uh, Municipal Agriculture Economic Development and Planning Forum. Can I get a mover? Moved by Mayor Bailey, seconded by Councillor McAlpine. Any questions to the report? I think this would be fantastic. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion is carried. 7.3 RPT-21-225 for the appointment of an engineer of the third concession municipal drain improvements. Can I get a mover? Councillor Coleman. Seconder? Councillor Laferrier. Any questions? Councillor Bell. And then Councillor Chambers. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, through you to staff, I think. Uh, could I, I would appreciate some instruction, the process that we follow to conclude that we need a drainage improvement. Uh, and then would also like to follow that up by understanding who pays for the engineering and who pays for the construction of the work on these drainage improvements. Mr. Walton. Hey, Mr. Chair to Councillor Bell. 
So um, when a drain is constructed under the Drainage Act, it's uh, constructed under the report of an engineer and a bylaw passed by the municipality. In this case, we know to finalize the construction of Watts Pond Road that we have to alter that construction and take this, this part of the drain, which is on the road allowance, and put it onto private property. So we're not in control of everything that happens here. Um, the engineer that's appointed for this decides on the, they write the report and they decide how it's to be constructed and who is to pay for it. So we'll find that out through the, through the preparation of the report. And what will happen is that'll come back to you as an engineer's report back to council for consideration of the construction of the report and passing two readings of the bylaw. And then there's the potential of people to appeal their assessment. And there's a court of revision for that. So there's a process that's built under the drainage act. Um, and, um, um, we got three uh, reports in a row here, which are all the same. <laughs> yeah, so, so th thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you, to be clear, Rob, then it's not so that it's necessarily the county that is paying for the work. Through you, Mr. Chair, to Councillor Bell. Um, in this case, it likely will be the county that pays the majority of because we're requesting this this drain to be taken off of the road allowance and put on private property. So, it's very it'll be very hard for the engineer to deem a lot of benefit to other landowners on this since we need it moved off it. But we may find through this process there's other improvements needed on this drain which affect other people too. So we'll go through that whole process. We'll meet with all of the landowners. We'll decide whether there's other improvements and then based on those improvements, um, it'll be decided how that's assessed out. Um, back in my days of consulting, I wrote probably a couple hundred of these reports myself. So I'm well familiar with the process, and uh, and uh, um, it, it's a good process. There will be there will be meetings um, with with uh, where all the landowners are invited. Thank you, okay. um, Councillor Chambers and Councillor McAlpine. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, my question is kind of related to all three of the next uh, seven one, seven two, and seven three. So I'm going to hold my question to the next report, if that's okay. That's your choice, Councillor. Thank you. Uh, Councillor McAlpine. I'm kind of with Council Chambers. Mine's kind of related, but it's more of a clarification on a process. Um, and I'm not sure if this is the right time to take it up, but I have a constituent that's been after getting his drain cleaned out for the last five years, and I understand he's up to have it cleaned up uh, this winter. Is this a new process where somebody has to come forward to um, have approvals of the, the drainage or is it in the case where it's just being, say, re-cleaned out because it's uh, silted up uh, that they have to reapply for a different process or something? Mr. Walton? To, yeah. Through you, Mr. Chair, to Councillor Malka Alpine. So when the drain, when I explained the process before where this drain where we're altering it, we'll have a new bylaw passed. Um, mm -hmm. And we have a bylaw for every drain that exists in municipal drain. The municipality, once that bylaw is passed and the drain is constructed, is required to do maintenance where it's required on it. So this, okay. this where you're suggesting a clean out is, is, is required. If it's a straight clean out and, and it's straight maintenance, like fixing a pipe or doing anything that's in the, in the bylaw, we, can, we are obliged to do that. And mm -hmm. on the line tonight, we actually have Shannon Tweedle, our drainage superintendent here. So she's hearing all this, so that's, that's, that's all good. And, and, and we actually just had a very nice email from uh, somebody today congratulating her on uh, her short time here and doing some very good work. So there we see her picture. Um, are you good with that, Councilor McAlpine? So just to clarify, so I would contact Shannon just to make sure that this individual is still in the queue then, I assume. That's correct. Okay, that's, thanks. Okay, any other questions to this one? Okay, so I guess uh, I, I've just got a quick one myself here and, and uh, Mr. Walton, you alluded to the fact that we have three reports here and they're all the same. Um, I, I kind of agree with that. Um, my question here, and it's kind of with them all, why do, we, why do we have three different engineering companies doing this if they're all the same? Through you, Mr. Chair, to yourself and, and the committee, um, the reports really aren't the same. Um, the third report, I believe it is, where we're appointing Case Smart um, um, Associates, they're actually already appointed on that drain. And what's happened there is that there's a new petition for another branch, which requires a petition, and it requires council to accept that and then decide who would do that. 
it would certainly be foolish on that one to appoint a different engineer than the one you've already got working on it. So my guess is that a lot of that work is already done and they're getting the process ready for them to finalize it and they're doing the paperwork. So, so in that case, it isn't the same as the others. Um, on the other two, um, um, we haven't, um, one thing about uh, municipal drains, and I'll say this for the benefit of all of council, I've written many of them. When you get into a municipal drain, you rarely know the scope of work. So it's not something that, um, and there's very few, not very many engineers that do them actually in the province, probably really 10 to 12 across the whole province that are really expertise in this. So um, generally um, you just appoint them and, and you know if they do a good job, you may appoint them again. And it's always nice to have a couple of them that do it. Um, we decided that these two um, engineers that were on uh, both uh, Bennett drain, I believe, and then the third concession drain that we would give them a shot at these and see how they do. The third concession drain is relatively straightforward, really what was proposed. It may get more complicated if we have other work. And the Bennett drain looks like it's, it's a more complicated one. We think we've, um, we're um, happy with the selections we've made of these two um, consultants and we'll watch them through the process. Okay, I appreciate that clarification, thank you. Seeing no further questions on uh, 7.1.2, I will ask for, sorry, 7.1.3, I will ask for, uh, let's vote all those in favor of the recommendation. Opposed? That motion is carried. Uh, okay, so moving on to 7.1.4, uh, RPT 21-227, uh, engineer for the Bennett Municipal Drain. Any questions? Uh, Councillor Chambers, did you wanna go at this time? Yeah, I, I would, uh, Mr. Chairman. And actually the, the three uh, drainage issues on the agenda, they are somewhat different. And um, this particular one, I, I've got a few questions on. The first one was altering a drain, which I can see um, you need an engineer to do the report. The last one, the, the CLOFER request, that's draining a new area and a, an engineer's report is required there. The, the Bennett drain, I'm, I'm confused a little bit uh, on this one because it is an existing drain and it, it seems to be, and this is where I need clarification, it seems to be that the drain uh, is in such a state that uh, it is not working as, as it's as supposed to be. And we're getting an engineer to re-look at the drain. Is that what's happening here? To, sure to well. you, to Mr. Walton? To you, Mr. Chair, to Council Chambers. So yes, when you have a drain that's of age like this and you, you'll want to change specifications to it, you need a new report under section 78 to do that. And this will give us, it, this, the procedure under section 78, except not having a, a petition, which has to be a majority in numbers or 60% or of the area requiring drainage, the municipality has to maintain them. If we decide that it has to be changed in a way that um, would require change to the specification and an updated report, section 78 is the appropriate way to proceed with that. And clearly on this one, the, the owners will be asking for a better drain than what they had, not just replacement of what's there. You're good with that, Councillor Chambers? Yeah, and, and that answers my question because in, in, in most cases, engineering reports are very time uh, consuming and very expensive to the uh, people who are assessed on the drain. And in terms of uh, what I'll call routine maintenance, we don't have engineers report, we just hire a, a contractor to do the, uh, the maintenance as required. And I was wondering if this was a situation where that could be done to save a lot of time and money to the assessed property owners. But what I'm hearing is, and, and I think uh, General Manager Walton has, has said that this particular drain, the Bennett drain is in such a state, uh, it was probably built in the twenties or something like that. It's a tile drain and uh, it, it uh, to make it, uh, beneficial to the property owners, uh, we need a new report and, and essentially a new drain. And, and he can uh, verify that my thinking is correct on that. I see Shannon's come on here as well. Did do you want to handle this one, Shannon or Rob or? Shannon can, uh, knows more about it than I do. Uh, yes, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, I can give you a little bit of history on the Bennett drain. Uh, we have had quite a few requests for maintenance on this drain. Um, currently on one property alone, we have seven blowouts on, on the tile itself. So it's in very poor condition uh, for uh, many reasons. We have uh, completed some uh, maintenance on one 
portion of the drain, but it is very clear that uh, replacing like for like is not going to solve any issues. There's still going to be blowouts on other pieces. We did a very rough uh, cost estimate on replacing the entire drain from the outlet to the, I believe it's the ninth concession road. And it was gonna cost about $300,000 to replace like for like, and that would not really aid uh, much of the problems that we're seeing with the new development in the area, the bigger storms, and the fact that this drain was actually designed to um, lower specifications than what we would design to today. So today we would design to an inch and a half coefficient. Back then, uh, this drain is currently sized for about half inch coefficient. Councilor Chambers? And, and just a, a comment, if I might, Mr. Chairman, it, it's a great advertisement for routine generalized maintenance on green on an ongoing uh, on uh, proactive uh, approach, because it's like a road. Uh, if, if you have one pothole, get out and fix it. Uh, because if you don't, there's gonna be another pothole, another pothole, and pretty soon there are so many potholes that you have to uh, reconstruct the whole road and grains are no different than that. So uh, hopefully uh, with, with the, uh, email that we uh, circulated today with the uh, proper owner uh, commending our drainage superintendent for the work that she did in the short time that she's been here and getting uh, something that's been on the, the, the table for such a long time uh, off the table. I, I think that uh, will eventually and, and uh, uh, no doubt uh, satisfy many of the property owners that are assessed on drainage throughout the, uh, at least the Western portion of the county uh, that uh, are uh, dependent on uh, farm draining. So uh, we need to be uh, proactive and, and keep these drains working to uh, prevent engineers' reports. And, and uh, uh, it's much easier to call up a contractor to, to, to clean a drain than hire an engineer to do a report and go through all that hassle. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Yep, thank you for that. Any other questions to this report? Seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed? That's carried. Uh, moving on to 7.1.5, RPT 21-226, which is the appointment of an engineer for the Mather Municipal Drain. Can I get a mover? Councillor Miller. Councillor Wheat. Any questions to this one? Councillor Miller. A couple questions. Um... Three to Shannon. Shannon, are you the drainage superintendent for Oxford or, your, or is your firm? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, we are appointed as drainage superintendent for Brant County. Mm -hmm. And I'm the named drainage superintendent for the firm, yes. No, no. Are you the drainage superintendent for Oxford, though? Not for Oxford County, just for Brant County. And your company isn't either? You're open? Not that I'm aware of, no. <laughs> okay. Um, just, I want to ask you a quick question there. You said uh, for the previous drain, it's going from half an inch coefficient to one and a half inch coefficient. That, that's not a factor of three. That's a factor of, um, you got, uh, is that a factor of nine? Uh, three, Mr. Chair. So the, the way the drain uh, drainage coefficient works is it takes um, um, that inch of water over a 24 hour period of way. So back mm. in the 60s, when this drain was built, it was quite common to, uh, design drains to about a half inch to one inch, so somewhere in between there. So yes, uh, it's it's quite a difference today. Okay, just checking on that. Yeah, no, um, I just and I, I will say uh, you you um, you made one of our um, landowners quite happy. And, and anybody that can make that guy happy can pretty much walk on water because <laughs> he's one miserable kind of fellow. So so far so good. So I appreciate the work oh. you're doing, Shannon. Thank okay, you. We're, we're, we're not going to we're going to avoid that comment, but uh, hopefully when the drain is fixed, we won't have to walk on water and I'll leave that one as that. OK, any other questions to this one? OK, all those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. Thank you very much for that. Uh, moving on to 7.2, I have two items to be received. Can I get a mover for both? Councillor Wheat, Councillor Coleman. Any questions on either of them? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? Carried. 
We'll move on to staff reports. Uh, 8.1, we've already handled. Uh, 8.2, uh, RPT-21-224, uh, request for sign modification at various locations. Can I get a mover, please? Councillor Howes, Councillor Coleman. Any questions for this? Councillor Howes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I have a comment and a question. Uh, Let's have the question first, Councillor. Okay, the question is specific to the... Uh, the two parking spots on Grand River Street North, uh, north of William Street on the east side. Um, I'm confident and well, let's say hopeful at least uh, that the, uh, the implementation of these two short-term parking spots will help to keep those spots turning over so that some of the merchants along that block who have, who have customers who are just coming in to pick up you know, their, their clean dogs or their tea or their takeout meal or their, their batteries, um, you know, they'll keep those spots turning over to, to help those merchants. Um, however, after five o'clock, there's one merchant open on that block. And it would be beneficial to that merchant and, and any others uh, that, that would be open past five o'clock if these signs could stipulate that it's a 15 minute time limit between 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. My question to staff is, is that easily achievable? Mr. Walton. Hey, Mr. Chair to Councillor Howes. Yes, there has been some discussion on this and uh, we, I think we were talking about eight to five, but um, staff are in agreement with that suggestion. Thank you. Very good. And your comment, Mr. Howes. Uh, just my comment was specific to the the um, staff recommendation on the the, the stop signs uh, for uh, northbound southbound on Whitlaw Way. I've spoken to the kind of the representative for some of the neighbors in the, in that neighborhood, and and they were explaining about their their desire to see this happen. I just wanted to thank staff for looking outside the manual for the the, the final con recommendation on this one it, and it, that's it's appreciated to to look at it more holistically than than just what the rule book shows so i just want to say thanks uh councilor Ferrier. thank you mr chair yeah i want i want to thank staff as well i also want to ask that um you know i know we've had a lot of really good discussion on walkability and here's an example of walkability coming into play in decision making um is there a way we may be able to you know, in the next year or two, formalize some of the walkability policy in terms of like to help staff with these decisions and to provide, you know, right now, I, I know it's open and, and you've shown that you can do it, but might it be beneficial to formalize it in terms of some walkability guidelines further and to help maybe with the safe streets piece? Because we've really focused on, on cars and safe streets, but I know we also have a mandate on safe streets around walkability and safe walkability. It's, it's one, one feeds the other. Three to staff. Uh, Mr. Walton, go ahead. Three, Mr. Chair, to uh, Councillor Ferrier. So you're going to have two documents which do this in the near future. First of all, the official plan will talk of this, but it talks of it in, in, in broad strokes. But there also will be a section in the Transportation Master Plan which talks about this. And um, I think we can all be proud that we're actually already doing projects right now which are already helping that out, um, you know, Kathleen Street and some other, uh, um, Laurel Street, um, what we're doing on Cedar Street, um, and uh, Birch, Birch, Birch and uh, Mount Pleasant as well. So it's not just, it's not just pairs. So we, we have a number of projects which we have staff initiated to get that going. So it's gonna come in those two documents and you're gonna see reference to that, which will reference those documents when they're finalized as well. So, so I hope that that's a good answer to that question. Wonderful, thank you. Excellent answer. Any other questions? Okay, we have a mover and a seconder. All those in favor? Um, sorry, so I, I just need to clarify something here. All those in favor, but we are looking at the uh, the 15 minute parking spot to be potentially between eight and five, that, keeping that in mind. So all in favor? Opposed? That is carried. Uh, moving on to 8.3, which is RPT-21-207, uh, the sanitary sewer grinder pump system policy. Um, I'm not sure if staff wants to speak to this or just answer any questions. It's, it's pretty straightforward there. Are there any questions to the report for staff? Councillor Miller. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, <clears throat> would you like it moved first to get it on the floor? Sorry, yes, my yes. Thank I, you. I will move Councilor, it. I will move it. Councilor Miller and Mayor Bailey. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. My question is: um, I, th I thought uh, the uh, author of the report uh, did a good job explaining why the county would be responsible for the maintenance and repairs of a standard package, and those individual or businesses, I guess, mostly uh, using a non-standard pump. Those users, they um, they are responsible for looking after the maintenance of their systems. But my question is, do those guys get a bit of a discount on their wastewater fees? Rob, do you want to tackle that? Through you, Mr. Chair, to Councillor Miller. The answer to that would, would be no. Um, um, the, and the, the reason for that would be is the, those, those bigger systems are complicated, but they're, they're mostly on properties where they're running that sort of a, that sort of a, a system already or would be running a septic probably, which would be, um, um, you know, have similar sort of pumps and, and, and other appurtenances <clears throat> as well. So, um, um, and, and can actually handle them. It's the, um, um, you know, the, the individual landowners that, um, you know, house and whatever, where they're really not set up to do, and it's better for us to set up for them to do it. And then we, we cover the maintenance of them. We do not cover, you know, moving them, replacing them, um, you know, life, life. We only do the with the life cycle, say, of the pump um, and, um, and, you know, being called for maintenance. There was a, Mr. Chair, just a follow-up question uh, to Rob. Have you ever, you ever gotten blowback on any of that? <laughs> You know that no. they have to look after their pumps, but the other guys with the standard ones don't. You, you, no blowback yet. Complaints, as you're aware. Through you, Mr. Chair, to Councillor Miller. Um, well, this policy isn't in place here yet, so we don't have a policy. We don't really have any of okay. these pumps yet. Um, I used to work in a place where we had a very similar policy, and uh, and um, and it, it worked very well there. Um, when we, where I used to work, where we implemented grinder pumps, we did not have a policy. We did have some initial, um, you know, problems with implementation. Um, part of it because of the installation of, uh, of pumps by people that were not qualified, mostly electrical problems where they didn't wire them right. So when we brought the policy into place to, to deal with that and, and had the whole thing of getting, you know, um, um, in, local installers all trained to do it. The problems disappeared basically, and and then when the the operators got such they knew what to do with them, it, it, it really um, um, solved itself. And that municipality has a couple of hundred of these now, so you know they're well experienced. And um, um, obviously, we um, shared information to help us do our doc. You're good okay. with that, Councilman? Uh, yeah. No. <laughs> I, from earlier this evening in our discussion, I think I think we need to be very cognizant of, of, of everything in our policies that we are we're approving here. But um, I, I I can see some blowback on this, but I, I do appreciate the answer. Thank you, Rob. Any other questions? Seeing none, it's moved and seconded. All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. Okay, um, moving on to 8.4, um, RPT-21-127, uh, the request for, request for municipal services to condominium properties. Um, this is quite a report uh, that was put on here. Um, I think what I'm gonna do if I could, uh, committee, I'm gonna ask Mr. Walton to kind of speak to this. And then uh, if there's any questions after that, uh, we will go from there. And just to remind everybody that Councillor Bell did have a, conflict of interest. So he is, uh, he is shut down until we're done here. So Mr. Walton, I'm just wondering if you could just uh, give us a, an overview of this report, just to try and clarify a few questions before they might be asked. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you to the committee. Um, so in February of this year, um, the Brandt um, um, condominium corporation um, um, came forward and asked for th basically three things for council. Um, to, uh, to do, which would put us in line with what Brantford does. So in Brantford, the city maintains their fire hydrants on, on their private properties. They maintain their storm sewers on private properties and they either provide garbage, garbage and recycling collection or they pay for their garbage and recycling collection if they can't provide it. So staff have spent uh, quite a bit of time researching both what happens in Brantford 
what happens in other municipalities around us and what we're doing here in, in Brant to, um, to deal with these properties. So let's start out with, with a couple of points that are they're actually made in the report, but I wanna make them again. Condos are designed in a way that private servicing is required. And this allows them to be, um, to have more density, to have efficiencies in how they're built and the like. And, and they're required to, to be there. You know, the fire hydrants and the storm chapters are required through legislative requirements to meet their requirements for distances from buildings and, uh, and from uh, um, storm, uh, storm water quality um, requirements uh, for the discharge to the, to the storm system. And the reason why many of them can't have uh, garbage and recycling collection is because they're set up in a way that the trucks and apparatus that we use to do that actually can't get on the properties. Um, you'll note that in uh, recently, um, I believe it's in the report here, I think it was 2018, we actually updated the policy here in Brant to deal with a couple of um, changes to our policy, but we actually will go on condominium properties where our trucks can basically can unimpeded drive through um, and, um, and do the collection or we'll collect at the, at the gate um, where, where they can have an assembly uh, or like so. So we're, we're, we're a bit of a hybrid there. One thing for us to remember is in Brant County, we're a lot different than the city. In the city, you know, it's predominantly urban. And, you know, well, if you do this for them, you know, it, it is more similar. But here in the county, we have rural properties. So through their taxation, they would help to pay for this if, if we did. And, you know, we just appointed three engineers on reports where we're going to have those folks all sharing in the cost of their drains, which they will pay not out of taxation, but out of their pockets for those drains when they're done. So it's, you know, the, the, the dynamics of the taxation set up and how we do drainage as it is in Brant County is different than it is in the city. We did find that no other adjacent municipalities pay for these services like this. Um, one important thing to note for council is this isn't just a, well, we can, it's not that big an amount of money we could do it. There actually would be staffing implications to do this, like the number of hydrants and the number of storm scepters and the changes to what we would have to do for garbage would have staffing implications, which we would have to ask for in the 2022 budget if you brought it forward. And the last point that I'd like to make is that, um, and I did write this in the report, we did meet with um, with John Gilson and the president of the Brant, um, um, Brant Brantford uh, Condominium uh, Corporation uh, Association um, a couple of weeks before this report was finished, just to talk to them and have a fulsome discussion on what they asked for what we thought we could do, what we thought we couldn't do, the reasons for that. And, um, and they really thanked us a lot for having the meeting instead of us just, you know, ignoring that and coming to council and saying, hey, we don't agree with them. The last, I guess the last point I'd like to make is I think that there are some important, important points to take out of this. Maintenance of fire hydrants is an important thing and we do want to, um, um, uh, um, and we'll do this through existing staffing. We're going to put together a system where we have notifications of those, um, all of those folks that, that this is our yearly requirement, ask them for their, um, their report so that we know that it has been done. And where they don't do that, we'll, we'll nag them and we'll, we'll keep at that. And we'll, we'll, we're gonna work with them a little on the storm scepters too. We do intend over the next year or so to, to get our own staff trained to do our own storm scepters. And I think coming out of that, we could get some cooperative work going on with, with others to do joint tendering and whatever. So that's something we'll bring back to council. So I think there's a few things that we've got here that which are very proactive towards getting us going. Um, the, one other thing I'll mention is, you know, we will be talking probably to the next council about um, implementing an urban stormwater utility where we go about an entirely different way about um, doing asset management and financing of, of storm. And, and that may lead us towards something where we could do more on the storm scepters part of this, but, but not really until we do that. So I think we've done a very, our staff did an excellent job of, of researching this. I think we've got a very thorough report here and we ask, um, you know, ask for if there's any questions on that and we would ask uh, council to pass this. Thank you. Um, thank you for that, uh, Mr. Walton, and, and my apologies to committee. I, I didn't get a mover and a seconder for that, so if I could do that, uh, Councillor Howes, Councillor Wheat, um, and, and thank you for that uh, clarification, uh, Mr. Walton. Any questions regarding the report back to General Manager, uh, Councillor Ferrier? Oh, sorry, I have a comment, not a question. Okay, uh, go ahead. Um, yeah, just uh, having having lived in two condos previously, um, you know, I, I, I do think there's an element of be careful what you wish for from a condo owner's point of view around municipal uh, garbage service. And that's not to knock municipal garbage service, but, um, you know, as a counselor, you know, Steve and I in our ward, we get complaints and things get missed and things happen. 
I, that's never happened at the condos I've been at, right? The, the garbage is, uh, there's, you, you get what you pay for in, in some of those ways. And I don't think, I, I know people say, well, you know, we're paying, uh, we're paying the same taxes as everybody else did, but that's part of the agreement, right? And that's known going in. When it comes to some of the other things, you know, I, I think it makes sense in community safety and we're going to work with the condo corporations and, and, and the rest. But uh, that piece, you know, I, I always tell my neighbors and, and some like to hear it and some don't, but, uh, you know, they're, they're getting a, an enhanced service, but it's also part of an agreement that you go in knowing uh, in this community what you're going to, or at least you should know. Um, that was the one piece, maybe I, I do have a question is, is, you know, I, I know it's not a responsibility, but are, are we still looking at being able to at least have a, a website that'll, that'll, you know, like brant.ca slash condos. That's something we talked about last time where people can be notified of what their rights and responsibilities are if they are purchasing a condo in the county of Brant and just having it spelled out really simply so that we aren't getting that, you know, I didn't know or how, how would I have ever known? Um, I, condo corporations are supposed to do that, but they don't always. Uh, Mr. Walton? Here you, Mr. Chair, to Councillor LaFerriere. Um, I think we could consider that. I think you got to watch out when you provide information like that, though, as to what you provide and what you don't provide. And then you aren't, um, you know, somebody doesn't try and hold you liable for, well, you didn't, you told us about this, but you didn't tell us about this. Like, really, when somebody buys a property, it's their lawyer's responsibility to point out to them what they're, um, what they're getting into. And the agreements are all registered. So it's, they're there. And I'm not sure how much farther than that we really should go. Fair enough. Um, except maybe to state that, you know, if you're buying a condo, you should look through your agreement because there's things like garbage and we could list the things that you could be paying for. Yeah, I, I think that's a, that's, a, that's a good call. It's a, you got to be careful what information is and it isn't there. Um, any other questions to this report? Okay, so there is a recommendation that's been moved and seconded. All those in favor of the recommendation? And opposed? That is carried. Okay, um, we're gonna wait. Oh, there's Mr. Bell back, thank you. Okay, so we're gonna move on now to 8.5, which is RPT-21-223, uh, the proposed community and safety zones. Can I get a mover? Mayor Bailey and Councillor Coleman. Um, pretty self-explanatory, but does staff want to speak to any of this or just answer questions? Mr. Walton? To Mr. Chair, to, to the committee. Um, well, I feel like I've had my work cut out for me tonight. I've been on the hot seat here all night, but anyways. Um, no, I think we're, we're, we're moving towards something here under Brant Safe Streets and, you know, towards the, you know, the eventual possibility of, um, you know, radar. Um, as to as to some of the tools that can 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 assist with um, with um, reducing speeds and especially in these areas of the community safety zones, just a couple of things I'd like to point out in this one is we've we previously passed a bylaw where we we put to many of the schools into forty kilometer an hour um, speed zones and we're we're basically going to that universally except three of the ones which are very high traffic ones, which already have the, the mechanisms there to, um, two of them have the mechanisms for us to have signs that are, um, you know, evident in the times which they're, um, 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 the time at which the speed is reduced. And I think on those very busy roads, that's a much more effective way of doing it than just having it the 40 all the time, because the, the pu public generally doesn't really respect that. And on a high volume road, I'd rather have it in the case where we're spending the extra money eventually on Grand River Street North to put that in place. We already have it in place on the other two and we just can't do it in immediately. We'll ask for the money in the budget and we'll try and get it done early in 2022. But I think it's a much more effective way of dealing with, you know, that flashing sign that says it's 40 kilometers an hour to me is more effective than a, just a standard sign saying, this is what the, what the, the speed is. And um, so that's the reason why we made that one differentiation for those three. And, our original recommendation, this was just to put it to 40 in all of them, but, but we rethought about what that meant for the, the signage just there. And, and we think that this is a more, uh, more appropriate way to go about it. So, and you know what, we can try it for a while and we can change it eventually if we, if we have to, but I, I think it's, it's much more effective. And as I drive through communities where the signage, you know, we're all changing all the signage with these, you know, these new speed signs and whatever, I, I, I believe it's more effective this way. Yeah, I, I would tend to agree with that. Any questions? Councillor Bell. 
Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, through you to Rob. Um, Rob, did you give any consideration to areas alongside old folks' homes, uh, retirement homes, so specifically Park Lane and Telford Place and Queensview in Paris? And on a more general note, uh, in relation to trailheads where people are pulling in perhaps with bicycles on the back or boats on the back uh, and, and a bit of uh, reduced speed would, would be appropriate. Mr. Walter, through you, Mr. Chair, to, to Councillor Bell. Um, this, this report was all about um, us um, concentrating on making everything similar in school, school areas. So, so we hadn't thought of those other ones. What we would have to do is go back and look at um, the requirements for what's what's eligible under community safety zones. Um, I don't think the second one you you note there is actually is even eligible, but but old age homes may be, and I I'm not sure off the top of my head. So I'll, I'll sub, certainly talk to staff about that, and uh, we'll look towards what what sort of the next phase of this would be. But as you know, like we had a ton of reports on here tonight, and you know us looking outside the box on everything to do on this is is kind of difficult. So we were concentrating this one on getting this. The, the a couple of speed zones change in, in establishing different community safety zones on this one even we've done this in a two-step report because um, a report earlier this year actually took those other ones down to 40 kilometers an hour but we had some more research we had to do to make sure we got the second piece of this right so um, we certainly as staff will go back and look at that and uh, and come back to council on it um, not in one cycle of council well, appreciate that any other questions Okay, all those in favor? Opposed? That is carried unanimously. Okay, moving on to uh, communications, number nine, uh, 9.1. There is a recommendation for to uh, resolution to support, support rail safety week. Can I get a mover? Councillor Wheat. Seconder? Councillor McAlpine. Any questions? Seeing none, all those in favor of the recommendation. Opposed? That is carried. Uh, 9.2, which is uh, Brant Family and Children's Services request for proclamation of Dress Purple Day from October 27th, 2021. Can I get a mover? Mayor Bailey and Councillor Coleman. Any questions on this one? All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. Okay, um, other business. Uh, we've got two under other business. 10.1 uh, street lighting in Highland Estates was uh, requested by Councillor Miller. So I'm gonna let you speak to that, Councillor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I hope everybody read the letter. Um, uh, I thought it was a good letter. Um, I'll just preface my comments first of all with um, the fact that there has been some work going on there. I talked to Rick Knapp and he said that there's been um, contractors there working. Uh, this is about a month ago. Um, and I'll also say too, as uh, Councillor Coleman likes to say, there's, there's three sides to every argument. So I understand that. Um, but at the same time, when I read the letter, there was things in there I, <laughs> I wasn't happy with. Um, in a perfect world, if somebody would call, uh, you know, public works or, or anybody in the county, they would they would get a response right away. Things would be done. So, um, just let me go to my notes here. Um, you know, in the letters, uh, the letter writer says, you know, they've been having some lights. It's been an ongoing issue for seven years. Uh, they've made repeated calls to public works. Um, it's not uncommon to find three or more street lights out in a consecutive row along Highland at any given time. So um, what I'd like to know is, is this something that uh, they're going to be replacing in the future? Is this something that other residents that have street lights, are they going through the same thing? Is this an issue before? Um, I know previously, um, if we had an issue with street lights, we'd call um, uh, our hydro distributor um but they're not responsible for for that now so um just just some of the questions like i say is this is this a common issue or are these lights going to be replaced anytime soon and, and how can we make our services better i'd like to see our services run like a, a hockey referee when the game's over 
the ref did such a good job. You don't know who the who the ref was. So I don't I don't want it to become an issue. And how do we how do we make this uh, not an issue? Um, and I, I appreciate that question, Councillor. I'm just wondering uh, to part of your question there, um, if if you would allow me, I, I'm curious to understand were these not replaced as part of the the whole retrofit with the LEDs? I'll, I'll put uh, that my in understanding is they were not. Interesting. So, uh, Mr. Walton, go ahead. Here, Mr. Chair, to um, Councillor Miller and the, and the rest of the committee. So, um, I'll have to admit, I, I don't have a, I don't, I'm not the expert on on street lighting in in in, in Brant County, but um, um, I have talked to my staff. What they say is, we need, we're, we are, have started to take a look at our street lighting um, inventory from an asset management point of view, and we will bring back some ideas that the councils how to do this. This particular subdivision has some older lighting in it that was done as sort of a decorative um, 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 fixtures and whatever. And I guess a lot of the people in, this, in the subdivision themselves don't even like the fixtures that are there and you get 10 different opinions on what they want. Um, generally decorative light fixtures are from a street lighting point of view, close to useless, quite frankly. And I think that we need to make some decisions if we go forward to change these as to what the standard is that we want to actually see. So. I think we need to look at the whole thing in an asset management type of uh, lens, you know, decide what we need to do and what needs to be replaced now and in the next, you know, five to 10 years and, and, and put a plan together. Um, so that, that's, that's entirely what we plan to do. And uh, they are working on an individual basis to keep lights running. So I think that the, some of the um, um, accusations we've heard on lights are, yeah, a little bit of exaggeration on some of it. I, I think we are getting back and fixing them. Some of the infrastructure is a little difficult to fix because it's aged and, and, and needs to be changed. That it can't be done for free. So we need to put a good plan together on this. And I think you've seen us do that in some other things that we, you know, Rome wasn't built in a day. We, we, we need some time to work on this and we're going to, uh, to do that um, hopefully in a reasonable period of time. See, Mr. Bradley's out there. Maybe he's going to help me out. Yeah, Michael, do you want to add to that? Sure, Mr. Chair. And I got lots of background with these lights. And so uh, maybe we'll go back and we, you know, back in 2015, 2016, we did, uh, we did upgrade the street lights. These were not included because they were decorative lights. And so um, the decorative lights, we had decorative lights here. And there was one other location in the county, and I can't quite remember. And because, because really our budget didn't allow them, because the replacement of the standards, so maybe we'll go back when we upgraded the street lights. We just did the cobra heads, and because most of those cobra headlights are sitting on existing poles, uh, the decorative lights have their own standard. So it's a complete replacement of both the standard and the light fixture. And we, uh, Mr. W Mr. Um, Mr. Noble, who actually looked after the the program, did a lot of work on trying to find a, a retrofitted um, a light that would fit onto those standards and we were never able to do that. So over the years, you know, we have done a lot of work on those lights. We've replaced them. Our lighting contractor uh, went through them all about five years ago and, uh, and, and checked all the wiring and uh, we replaced quite a bit of wiring on them, but they are at end of life and the, the cost to replace them as decorative standards was quite high. So as Mr. Walton says, this is something we can, uh, we can, we can have a look at um, because they are going to need to be completely replaced. We're going to basically have to, the, the decorative light standards are going to be taken down and, and replaced. The third problem we had out there is the, is, the, is the hydro infrastructure itself, the buried hydro infrastructure that feeds the lights was also at end of life. So that moved us from just replacing the, uh, the standards themselves to replacing all of the hydro infrastructure because it's buried underground hydro there. There's no overhead hydro. So it's, it's a lot more complicated than it sounds and, and the costs you know, they weren't in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. They were definitely up in the millions of dollars to, to do those lights. So, you know, it's something we've put a lot of time in. We haven't got a solution yet. I think we have done a lot of light repairs out there and I'm sure we can continue to, to lurch them through until we can find a final solution. So, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Miller? Can I just, I'll just say, I, I appreciate the answers. Um, I, guess, I guess I guess it's gonna be my job to, to push for that plan. So um, in the meantime, um, I'm just, one thing I'm wondering maybe um, could be part of that solution, given that they are decorative and they're not your standard, we could maybe look to those rate, pay those rate payers, those houses to, um, you know, look at it as a, an improvement uh, kind of tax or, or fee or whatever we call that, because 
Um, like I say, if they're going above and beyond what we we do as a standard, then then I think that would be a good argument there. And I, I'm sure a lot of them would would uh, would be agreeable to that. So, OK, um, lots of work to do, but uh, at least I have a, an answer for this rate payer. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Chambers. Yeah, I, I uh, struggled with this for many years. Uh, one of the issues is that the uh, decorative lights, it's hard to get replacement parts uh, for some of the components that are actually obsolete. And uh, as Michael said, it's, it's, it's uh, not as simple as it sounds. I, I'm just wondering, uh, we, we, we are looking at this. I'm wondering if we could have some sort of a time frame and some sort of a, a follow-up report on uh, various options to uh, eventually uh, improve the lighting, uh, whether it be through uh, replacement or uh, uh, any other options that, that may be available. Is there a time frame uh, that we can uh, expect to report on options and, and costings associated with uh, replacing uh, the street lighting in the Highland Estates? Through you to Michael, maybe? Michael, Mr. Mr. Chair, I, I can't give a, a definitive timeline. What I can I commit to is Mr. Walt and I will discuss, and if we can get something to you in a couple of meeting cycles, we'll do that. Mr. Mr. Noble had done quite a bit of work on this, and I think we parked it because we just really didn't have a what seemed like a good option to present to council. So I'm sure we can we can chase that 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 research that he did down, and uh, and then we probably get something uh, to council in, in a couple of months if we're able to. And I appreciate that, uh, Mr. Chairman. It, it's, it's really difficult to tell ratepayers that uh, uh, we're looking at it uh, without some sort of a, uh, an end goal in mind. So if we can say we're looking at it and expecting a, uh, a report of options within a, a couple of cycles, that goes a long way into uh, being credible in a response to ratepayers when they send emails such as uh, the one Mr. Miller got. Okay, um, anything further on that one? Okay, uh, thank you for that. 10.2, uh, the proposed renaming of the South Dumfries Community Center to the Gockel Memorial Arena. Uh, Councillor Wheat. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, I'd like to make a motion that uh, due to a series of events that have occurred over the last 50 years, I'd like to move on from the South Dumfries Community Center name and rename that building the Gockel Memorial Arena. Seeking a seconder, I believe I have one. Seconder for that, Councilor McAlpine. And Do you I'll, wish to speak to it further? Yes, I'll speak to it. Ballpark 50 years ago, St. George did not have an arena. South Dumfries Township did not have an arena. Earl Gockel organized minor sports in St. George. Minor hockey was played at the Air Arena. We had a minor hockey system. Oh, Councilor, we we, Councilor Wheat, sorry to interrupt you. Can you just sit up just a little bit? We want to see your smiling face when you're talking, not top oh, of your head. Okay. You can hear me okay this way, John? Yep, yeah, that's perfect. Yep. Okay. So we St. George had a minor hockey system, but they played in air. So together with the Township of South Dumfries and the Lions Club of St. George, a fundraising effort was put forward through the Lions Club to raise money to build an arena here in St. George. And that happened. And the fundraising was kind of led by the Lions Club and the Lions member. And I was fortunate enough to get chosen to go with the Lions member. And that was Doug Brown, who started HD Brown Enterprises. And we knocked on doors. Everybody had a street to look after. And families or households donated $52 a year, four payments of $13 to raise money to build the arena. When construction started, Earl Gockel was working for either Cockshut or Massey in Brantford and was laid off. He was appointed kind of like a Claire Wamsteaker is in the county of Brant to oversee the construction, which he did. When, when the arena opened, Earl got called back to work at either Massey or Cockshut, I can't remember which, but it was a farm implement dealership or construction company in Brantford. And a chap named, I believe, Robert Chambers might help me. His name was Al Palanio, became our first arena manager. At the same time, Burford stepped forward and built an arena too. And Al left us, St. George, and went to Burford to manage that arena. 
Earl Gockel then left his job at the farm implement construction company and became our arena manager. And he was there forever and a day. His son, Ken, was an employee. And ultimately, when Earl retired, Ken became our manager. The apple did not fall very far from the tree. And Ken became our arena manager. During that reign of Ken, his father, Earl, passed away. And then eventually, uh, Ken retired, and we have a new arena manager, and you'd swear his last name was Gockel. He's a Paris boy, Keith Roswell. And then about a month ago, Ken, unfortunately, contacted cancer and didn't last very long, and now Kenny's gone. And I would really like to rename that arena in honor of the Gockel family, Earl and Ken, who were our arena managers, save for year one, and now currently while Keith Roswell is the manager there. I've talked to that with the arena staff, with Keith and the, board, and the boys, and they're in total agreement with me. I've mentioned it to members of the Lions Club here in St. George, and they're in agreement with me too. I'm here to answer any questions. Mayor Bailey. Well, Councillor Weed, I think that's very nice of you and, and it's all fine and good. Uh, when I was a kid, I didn't play hockey in air. I played hockey in Linden. Uh, and that's where the hockey, minor hockey went. It wasn't in air at all, it was in Linden, which was the coldest arena in Ontario. Um, but anyway, I think it's very nice what you wanna do for, for Ken and for Earl and Al and Rick and Patty and Kathy, all of the gockles. But I think Councillor Wheat, um, you've already done that. You, you've named a street after them. The arena sits on Gockel Street. The reception hall in the arena is the Gockel Family Memorial Banquet Hall. And I think it's because it's so close to raising money for the health hub and stuff. And I see different people's names going on different rooms and areas. Uh, to, to do this, we also have two portraits of Ken and Al at the front door of the arena. So we, we, we certainly have appreciated what the Gockles have done for South Dumfries and for St. George, and we've acknowledged them and we've honored them in a very big way already, Councillor Wheat. And, I, and we've even just put Ken's birthday and death day on the ice in the arena. I mean, we don't do those things for people that just pass away coming through uh, South Dumfries. So I think we've done a very good job of, of remembering Earl and, and Kenny. Um, I think this is this is not a good idea. And I think it's not a good idea because I can think of three people, including the former mayor, who is all about South Dumfries. And when you walk into any facility and you go down Gockel Street to the Gockel reception area in the Gockel Arena, it's not right, Councillor Wheat. It doesn't give any kind of acknowledgement to the people that were in place that, that made that arena happen. Ken, Ken Gockel was a wonderful guy. Earl Gockel, wonderful guy, but they were both county employees and we paid them very well. And of course they did a great job. If they didn't do a great job, they wouldn't have been there for 50 years. But you know, you have to remember that I was the one, you were the one getting money, doing paper drives, doing bottle drives, raising money to build that arena. I was a kid, I was 12 years old. We did walkathons from Glen Morris to St. George. We raised the money and the Gockels were the employees and very good employees. And we've honored them, Councillor Wheat, in a very big way. And it's time to put somebody else's name in association, another good name that is as good as the Gockel name to do with St. George and South Dumfries. There are very few things left with the name South Dumfries on them. And just like Scotland or Oakland or any other part of the county, we've branded Brant beautifully, but I don't wanna see the final pieces of Scotland and Oakland go or South Dumfries go. You know, th this needs to be another name, Councillor Weed, if you don't wanna leave it as South Dumfries, but it's overkill, I think. I think when you cheapen something by putting it everywhere, it does cheapen the brand. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm really kind of sorry that you did this because no matter how this works out, I'm either a villain because I don't think that everything should be Gockel or you win and I'm still a villain. So I, I've spoken up tonight because I truly believe that if you walked into a place, even in Burford, and it was the Roger Davis this on the Roger Davis that with the Roger Davis room and the Roger Davis this, 
it cheapens the whole thing. And with the health hub, it's going to be beautiful. You're going to have all these wonderful names associated with a wonderful facility. And I think that we need another name other than Gockel on that arena because you know what? We all raised money for that thing. You went door to door. I did other things. A whole generation of people, Councillor, we worked very hard, including the politicians in place, the Taylors, Bob Taylor, Tommy Taylor, Mayor Eddie. So many people have names that are suitable if you want to take the name off the South Dumfries Arena. But I don't understand why you would want to. It's part of our identity. We'll never get back. So that's what I have to say. That's it. Anybody else want to speak to the motion? Councillor Wheat? Yeah, just to reply to uh, Mayor Bailey, the hockey that was played at the Linden Arena was school hockey. St. George minor hockey did play in air. The Linden Arena was school hockey. And I know because I played. Okay, we're not going to go back and forth nope. with the, where the arena was and this and that. I think I think we've each made the you've made the point there. Is there anybody else who wishes to speak to this? Councillor Chambers. Yeah, I, uh, I can, <clears throat> can speak for, for someone that uh, doesn't live in South Dumfries and uh, has not been a, a patron of the uh, South Dumfries uh, arena. Uh, I used to play hockey in the Lions Billion at the Burford Fairgrounds with the firemen flooding the ice between periods. Uh, I, 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 I'm going to support the resolution. I, I know uh, I, I did know Earl or Ken personally. I associated them uh, with the, the arena as many people in other arenas, such as the Burford uh, Community Centre associates the Gockles with the uh, South Dumfries Arena. Uh, and, and some people call it the Gockle Arena already uh, because of the uh, uh, respect that the fraternity of people who use arenas, the, the minor hockey people and, and the figure skaters, et cetera, uh, they, they uh, uh, recognize the contribution that Earl and, and Ken um, made to the arena above and beyond uh, being simply county employees. Uh, they uh, have demonstrated time again, uh, and you could see this from afar, that they, uh, they were more than county employees uh, working at the arena. They were, uh, this, they, uh, uh, their life was the arena in, in many respects, at least that's the impression that they gave uh, to the people uh, away. So I'm gonna support the, uh, uh, the, the resolution. I think history is important and, and people make history and certainly the Gockles made uh, history in, in the arena at, at St. George. Uh, Councilor Miller. Um, this is a, this is a tough one. <laughs> um, I, I, I appreciate what the, the mayor said about the South Dumfries name. Um, if you look at uh, our neighbor to the um, east, uh, Wentworth County, there's no Wentworth County anymore. Um, gets swallowed up by by uh, Hamilton, and uh, th there there is something in that name. He's he's absolutely right. Um, but I guess my question uh, to you, Mr. Chair, to um, is to Councillor Wheat is is what have we done thus far for the Gonkles in recognizing them? Um, and is, is there is there anything else that ever came to mind other than renaming the South Dumf Dumfries Community Center? Because I, I, I agree with him. I mean, uh, I think he, he needs respect. He, he did a, he did a great service. Um, but is is there another way that that's all I'm asking that that you've talked to or thought about? Councillor Wheat. Yes, I'll respond. Um, a few years ago, we had to rename some streets because we had duplication throughout the county on street names. So the street, there's only one building on Gockle Drive. That's the arena. It's a very short street. So that street was called Gockle Drive. So we, we named that street after the Gockle family because of the arena. And Earl was the manager at the time. We were renaming streets in the county because of duplication. So that street was named Gockle Street. 
Gothel Drive, actually. Okay, so so no thoughts about naming uh, the the room up above the Gothel um, Community Center or um, what, what what banquet room or anything like that? Yeah, the yes, and the banquet room is the Gothel Banquet Room Banquet Hall. Yes. Okay. Thank thank you. I, pre I appreciate that. Councilor Ferrier. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, the good points on both sides on this one. It, it's it's a tough one. I, I may I may end up leaning just where the St. George councillors go, but I, I, I guess I have maybe two queries. And, and one is when we look at what's happening with the idea of this, like the timing's a little tough because, you know, I wonder if there might be an opportunity to go to the community and say, you know, hey, community, you know, what do you want to see? Oh, that could be messy. I also wonder about if there are rooms and things named after the Gockles within the building, if this does change, maybe we should look at renaming, you know, those, those rooms um, to support or to honor other folks. Um, I know St. George is a, a growing community and there'll be more opportunities to name things, but um, I also wonder how this interacts with our, our naming policy on, we just had a new naming policy on parks and, you know, there's a process and there's, you know, community input and, and, you know, I know Councillor Wheat's gone to members of the community, but I wonder if we weren't in a time of COVID, if this might happen in a different organic way. I, I, sorry, there's a bunch of questions there. One is, you know, would that be, would people be open to renaming parts of the inside if this was to pass? And also what should we be doing in the broader sense? Maybe this is more for staff to think about because uh, we have it about parks, but what about other things? Like, you know, heck, I'd, I'd love to see a Simons Park and a, a, you know, Ron Eddy Way and, and, and the rest too. You know, how, how do we come to those decisions other than members of council? The only other thing I want to say is there are lots of SILAPS buildings in Ontario, and I don't think any take away from the other. So just to keep that in mind, whatever way the decision goes, you know, there's a SILAPS youth center, there's a SILAPS building, there's uh, the SILAPS right, you know, down the street here. And I'm, I'm glad it's not named the Paris Community Center, because I do think that does honor. But I, I think this is a little more complex. Um, yeah, it's going to be an interesting vote either way, but I, I'm glad there's good arguments on both sides. Anybody else? Okay, so we've got a, a motion on the table that has been seconded. We've had conversation in regards to this. So I am going to call the question, all those in favor of the motion. Opposed? The motion is carried. Okay, so that brings us to uh, in camera. If I could get a motion to move in camera. Mayor Bailey, Councillor Coleman, all in favor? Opposed? Carried. Buckle up, we're going to a room.
That was much better, people. Much better. Okay, I think just Councillor Coleman. He didn't click the button. Can we just confirm that there's nobody left in the breakout room? Don't leave him there. He can starve to death. <laughs> he was eating something, so he'll be okay. Gary, I'm not sure if you're still on. Can you tell us if Councillor Coleman is still around? Well, let me see if I can have a look at that one moment, please. Thank you. Yeah, I don't see him at all. Is Michael back on? Yes. It looks like he may be disconnected. Okay. He the up. meeting totally. That's fine. Um, okay. So uh, there's nothing else for the regular agenda. Um, next meeting, I don't have a date for it. Uh, let me just see here. So I'm thinking in a month. the 19th, I believe, somewhere in there. But uh, we, will, we will get that information from the, the clerk. And uh, as our mayor would say, anything else for the betterment of the community? And I will ask for adjournment. Oh, one, one thing, just there, there was a federal election. So congrats to all those uh, working the polls and the elections, Canada folks, the candidates, the volunteers, takes a whole community. And, and uh, yeah, it's just wonderful. And we have three different writings that represent so we have extra people to thank. So just wanted to throw that out there as a former federal candidate. It's a lot of work, so good on them. Appreciate that. Good okay. post today, Mark. Good post. And uh, since I can adjourn this myself, I'm going to do that. And to all a good night. <laughs>